What's up, everybody? Welcome to Flex Harmonic. I'm David Wilson, and unfortunately, I just uh, took a bite of a cookie right before I started the stream, so I uh, got a little bit delayed there. Uh, hello to Mr. Bill T. Gone it, gone item. Gone, I don't really know how to pronounce your name. I apologize about that. But I appreciate that you're always here. Um, so let me see. Uh, T says, sheesh. Is it because I was late or because the audio is too loud? I'm kind of curious about which it is. I had to bump the audio a little bit because uh, my daughter is currently playing with her cousin and we're in a very small apartment and it's extremely loud. So I'm trying to drown out some of that noise with uh, the background music. Hey, Bill and Daigo. So uh, I've been having a pretty fun week uh, doing a little bit of hacking on Flux Compose behind the scenes. We're going to talk about that uh, just in a second. Gun says uh, uh, gun enum. OK, cool. I'll remember that. I always appreciate it whenever I get uh, pronunciation help because I like to pronounce it, pronounce things correctly, and I often don't. So if I ever say your name wrong on any stream that I do, please tell me and uh, I'll be happy to say it uh, correctly the next time. Hello to uh, Piotr. All right, so uh, let's see. <laughs> Sheesh is cheering. Okay, cool. Even better. Thanks. So um, another stream where I'm going to be basically coming in saying I've changed my mind on something I wanted to do uh, for this project, and um, I will try to explain to you why I decided to do that. So uh, the title of this stream, or I guess the topic of the stream today is uh, creating a scripting language in five days. Um, and the goal for today is to replace Guile with a custom scripting language that I've been working on. So we're going to give that a little bit of a try today. Uh, so probably you're wondering, why would I bother trying to create a language? And in fact, let me just bump this audio down a little bit. The music is starting to annoy even me. So let me just tweak that slightly. Okay, I made this better. So um, over the last couple of weeks when we've been doing, doing these Flux Harmonic streams, uh, one of the recurring themes is the struggle with um, trying to call C functions from Guile Scheme. And the whole idea there is that I wanted to use a Lisp language, like a, or specifically a scheme language, to drive the tools that I'm writing for my creative projects. And um, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I like how interactive Lisp languages are, where you just have a, a text file open and you can have a REPL connected and you can start evaluating forms and have stuff happen, happen in the, uh, the application automatically or in, in interactively in real time. So um, that was sort of the, the thought process that I had for a while when I've been thinking about making this project. And um, Guile Scheme seemed like a really good starting point just because I've been using it for, you know, configuring geeks, and I've also started talking about it a little bit on uh, the System Crafters channel. So it made sense to uh, continue following that path in this project as well. But um, as as powerful as Guile is, and as much powers, <clears throat> excuse me, powers they give you to actually be able to invoke C functions from Scheme, uh, it still, you know, caused us a lot of trouble trying to wire those things up. So it got me to think about you know, maybe Guile isn't the best implementation. Maybe I should look into a different implementation of Scheme that is more, you know, meant for actual embedding in a program. Guile itself is not necessarily meant for embedding per se. It is meant for being used as an extension language to C programs. Uh, and it's sort of meant to be the scripting language for, for the GNU project. But it's not meant to be embedded per se. It's sort of like a, a sidecar to your existing code. Um, I started looking into using another scheme implementation I've used before called Chibi, which is actually something that you embed into your program. Um, but the reality is that the um, the C binding story was pretty much the same. Or actually, I would say required even a little bit more work than what Guile does. Um, Guile does give you the ability to call directly into C functions, but the problem is that it's harder to figure out sometimes the right way to invoke it. Now, uh, that said, Ashraz did actually figure out a way to uh, invoke the function we were trying to do the last time. So we were trying to write a function that renders the current scene to a file and passing the string for the file name over to the Guile layer or from the Guile layer to the C layer seemed like it was going to be difficult. Um, and we did not figure that out on the stream. Uh, Ashraz did give me some code after the fact that he figured out um, how to do it, but I was still sort of already on that path of thinking how I would like to do this differently. So um, 
I started thinking even more about this and it occurred to me that if I'm only using scheme as a control language that binds to the C layer, then why should I use a full language and programming system for that? I mean, it seems kind of heavyweight to use Guile scheme, which is pretty big. I mean, it's its, its own language and runtime. Uh, even Chibi scheme is a pretty full uh, scheme implementation that has a lot of libraries and stuff that comes with it as well. So why would I want to go and pull in all that stuff when really all I want to do is have my own functions defined in C and then invoke them from a scheme like language. So uh, this weekend I had a crazy idea. Uh, I would try to create my own scheme inspired control language uh, that would be purpose built for this project. So we're not going to try to implement actual scheme or Lisp. We're going to use scheme or Lisp style syntax, basically uh, S expressions or what looks like S expressions where you have uh, nested lists that comprise all of the code. And the reason why I would do that is because I, I do feel that that syntax is very amenable to um, interactive development because it's easy to know where expressions start and finish. And uh, it's easy to write code that processes those uh, that that syntax. It's easier to write a parser for a Lisp style language than it is to write a C set for a C, C style language, in my opinion. Uh, just because you can easily write a recursive descent parser that uh, is able to just look at, you know, where parentheses start and end and everything in between is just, you know, symbols of the language effectively. So um, I'm not going to call it an actual scripting language yet because we're going to avoid uh, adding certain things like control flow and other stuff that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, as long as we can. So I'm going to see how far we can get with it just being a direct portal into the C program. Uh, we're not going to be doing direct C function invocation. We are going to actually have a binding layer that binds C functions into the language. But I feel like that is acceptable in this case. And we can talk a little bit more about why I think that uh, in a bit. Uh, another benefit of doing this is that I get uh, complete control over memory management and also how code execution is integrated with the language or with the runtime, I guess I should say. So with the uh, runtime. So um, scheme implementations typically are using garbage collection. I mean, I would say 99% of the time you're going to use garbage collection with a scheme impl implementation. Uh, they all have, you know, different strategies for how you would do garbage collection. There's a different, you know, a few different techniques for that. Um, I kind of want to avoid having to do typical garbage collection, I would prefer that um, whenever you evaluate code in this language, it is a little bit more amenable to data oriented programming, which may not be fully possible. But uh, the idea being that, you know, the locality of things in memory is a very effective for the CPU cache. Uh, the way that I've written the parser, the, le the tokenizer in the parser so far actually does fall within that category, but uh, actual evaluation may be slightly different on that front. But uh, that's something that we will uh, experiment with over time, I think. Um, and also about the uh, execution thread issue, um, at least with Guile, it had its own execution thread that I had to, you know, I had to start up another thread entirely to run all the rendering code. In this case, I have full control over when expressions get evaluated or when they even get read in from input from the REPL. So in theory, I could just have my single thread that is um, asynchronously pulling a socket, listening for input from the REPL, and then execute a, an expression only whenever it's necessary and do it within the, the, um, the actual event loop of the program. So uh, that means that threading issues are, will be reduced, so long as I don't use threads for other things. And um, it will be a lot easier to synchronize certain behaviors. So I think that that will actually help out with some of what we're doing. Now, obviously, you could say uh, this can mean that it causes slowness in the loop, but really this would only happen if you were executing code all the time. Uh, like I said before, the, the purpose of this is just to transmit information from the author of the project or author of whatever creative work is being worked on at the moment to the C layer. So um, there is really no constant execution of code from the higher level scripting language layer. It's just sort of like translating immediately from that that code into C functions and C data structures. Um, and the most important reason for wanting to do this is that it's uh, fun. I like writing language implementations. Over the last couple of years, I've had two other instances of projects where I was writing my own Lisp or scheme implementation for various purposes. 
And uh, this is another instance for me to do it, but in a more constrained scope where I get to have, you know, take very specific decisions that work for this project and not try to write some general purpose language. So I think it's kind of fun to have a um, very specific use case here so that we can play with language design a little bit and try to figure out some cool ways to apply this. Um, also, I want to say hello to Johnny Walker and uh, to uh, John. Uh, thank you both for joining. I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, Mr. Bill says, this is fun. I want to create a custom language for my engine too. Well, you know, maybe uh, whenever we're chatting on these streams, we'll have some ideas and we'll both get to implement some cool language features. So let me just get a sip of this uh, coffee here and we'll move on to the next slide. All right, let's talk about the language design itself. So since this language is actually being created specifically for this project, we get to choose how it works. Uh, we're not going to be following any existing language specifications. Uh, we will be taking inspiration from things that make sense from different languages. But uh, this is really sort of a blank slate, basically, for how things are supposed to work. And um, more importantly, we get to choose what not to implement, which is very important when it comes to trying to get things done fast. If you don't have to think about a lot of different use cases or edge cases or anything like that, you can really quickly get something working, which is basically what I've been trying to do, and then be able to become productive with it quickly. So uh, I kind of like the fact that, you know, by saying no to certain things, we actually get a result more quickly. And then I think it will increase the leverage of what we can do with this project a lot more quickly than if we were to use some other language, mainly because we have total control and we can um, avoid some you know, certain class of problems, like I was saying about, you know, threading and synchronization issues before. So uh, what do we really need from such a language? It's like I said before, this is a control language for the C engine layer. So what do we really need to actually communicate from the Lisp or scheme style language down to C? Uh, we need a specific set of primitive data types. Obviously, you're going to need primitive data types. So things like strings, integers, floating point numbers, uh, lists, and also time. So since we're going to be dealing with music, video, um, potentially game programming, um, having time be a first class language um, type or concept could be interesting basically to, to specify, let's say five seconds or something like that with a specific syntax. So I want to add stuff like that in so that it's easier for me to express certain things like timing for different events and whatnot. Uh, also, we need to be able to invoke C functions and declare bindings in a convenient way. So uh, the whole point here is that this language exists to call directly into the C layer. And if we need to add new functions for this language to be able to call, it needs to be easy to add them and it needs to be easy to implement the behavior in the C side of the functions. Um, so right now, I think that we've got a decent or I'll show you what I've been doing. I've, I've got a decent idea for how to, to make it work, but I think over time we'll figure out some optimizations to the pattern for describing bindings that might make it even quicker to deal with. And over time, I mean, we could just realize, oh, we can call directly into C. We don't have to worry about doing any translation. So uh, it's just a matter of iterating on that concept as we go. But uh, I'm going to try to be very pragmatic and just get things working first and then build it up as we go on in later streams. Um, also, we're going to have a very limited concept of scope for now. Um, if you have studied programming languages to the extent that you sort of know how they work, uh, scope is a big um, concern in terms of, you know, how you are able to re uh, resolve variable references or function references. Uh, for now, we are only going to be concerned with module scope. We're not going to have any kind of function scopes or anything like that. Just basically whatever you see in the current file is what's available in the the scope of the quote unquote program. It's not really a program. It's more of a, a description of a project. Um, later, if we decide to add things like functions and whatnot, we will have to deal with scoping. But like I said, I'm going to try to avoid that because I don't really want um, the C layer to have to execute functions defined in this layer. So we'll, we'll see about that. Maybe maybe I'll change my mind on that in the future. But for now, we're going to try to avoid it. Uh, also, we want to make sure that the language enables an interactive workflow. So we need a REPL when we need uh, constructs that are uh, evaluable. And when I say that, what I mean is, aside from the language itself being conducive to interactive programming, we also need to design the, um, the way that you use the language, the constructs or the ways that you call f functions to, uh, and even the C bindings themselves, uh, to make them amenable to reevaluation while the 
uh, the, the program is running. So we want to be able to update what we've written in the file and see those changes happen immediately inside of the, the preview window. Uh, and lastly, we need to be able to send individual commands from the editor. Um, and in this case, the editor being Emacs, we need to be able to do things like invoke the preview window, uh, start and stop the transport for uh, playing audio or video, um, changing the project, uh, in, you know, maybe causing uh, properties of certain things to be changed, etc. So um, aside from the need for a language to describe what should be displayed or, or played in audio form or whatever, we also need a way for the runtime to accept commands and the commands will be sent at the same way as what you see in the documents. You know, it's just going to be function calls, etc. So um, I it's just it's basically going to be like a scheme or a list where you have a REPL and you're sending commands to it and that's what happens. So uh, we're just going to continue building on that concept as we go here. Hello to uh, Ronnie and uh, Ayat Kittul, Kittul, Ayat Kittul? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, let's talk about what we don't need for now, at least. We do not need logic constructs and control flow. So we don't need if statements. We don't need loops. Um, those aren't necessary because we're we're taking a declarative approach to describing describing what should be happening in the creative work or in the project. So if we're rendering something to the screen, we're sort of taking a declarative approach to describing what to be dis what should be displayed. We're not going to write loops to say, I want to render 1000 things. Now in the future, it may become necessary for generative art or other things of that nature to have loops or functions, but we're going to wait until we get to that part. For now, the things that I have in my head are all mostly about like describing specific things I want to display or audio that I want to create, et cetera. And I think that most of it could be done declaratively without any kind of uh, functions or logical constructs. And also that's the next thing, functions and lexical scoping. We don't really need that yet. Um, I don't rule it out, but like I said, I'm gonna avoid it as long as possible. Data structure definitions, like uh, complex data structures, and et cetera. Um, we don't need that in the, um, in the language layer, the scripting language layer, because we have that already in C. So the C program understands the, C, the data structures that are defined in C. Um, the way that the code will work on the scripting language side is that you just sort of describe what things you want. And that gets boiled down into C function calls that create the requisite data structures. So um, the, the scripting language does not need it to be able to describe those things because they already exist. The scripting language purely interfaces with the C layer through function calls. Um, macros, we don't need macros yet, but there's a chance we will want them at some point in the future, especially if we want to um, make the language a bit more expressive in terms of how you can declaratively define things. Um, but the design for the language I've come up with so far should be um, smooth enough for now so that we don't really need it for a while. Uh, but it really just comes down to like, if I'm trying to write this stuff in practice to create a project, um, do I feel like I'm having to write too much code? Do I want to kind of simplify the patterns and whatnot? Uh, the, the reason why a macro would be helpful there is because I don't have to literally follow the definition of the language, which is everything needs to be a function call into the C layer. I can have a layer above, which sort of translates some structures of code into the actual C function calls at the scripting layer. So uh, sometime later, we probably will do that, but for now we won't. Uh, also, library modules defined in the language. Um, this is something that we don't need immediately, but I can already imagine a use case for library modules. Let's say, for instance, um, if I wanted to reuse some um, assets for making thumbnails for videos, or if I wanted to reuse some definitions for audio plugins or synthesizers, etc., whenever we start getting to the audio side of things, it would be nice to define libraries of those in the scripting language itself and be able to load those in to various projects. So we have like a load path and then load in modules, but we don't need that at the beginning. At the beginning, we can just copy and paste code and just, you know, go on with our business. So uh, we're going to try to be pragmatic. Pragmatic is sort of the the uh, the word of the channel here, which we're just trying to build things up and polish as we go. So we'll deal with library modules and stuff like that later after we sort of see a direct need for it. 
Um, and I'll also say that this is more than just a data format. Um, since we can actually invoke functions in the C layer, it allows us to automate behavior where necessary. So uh, what I'll show you in a second will look sort of like, you know, a data format to some degree. Um, but really, it is just, you know, supposed to be directly function calls. All right, so let's take an actual example or look at an example code snippet for what I have in mind for this language. And I think that will be better than me just talking on and on about language features. So um, this snippet demonstrates some of the ideas that I have in mind. It's sort of the, my current state of where I've been thinking about all this. And um, let's just take a look at what I've, what I've got here. Um, so first of all, we will have things like define, which is what you see in scheme for defining a binding for a, a symbol name to some value. So in this case, we're defining a font called font Jost, and then it calls a function called font and basically says the font family is Jost star and the weight is medium. So this is basically us loading a font into the project so that we can use it to render text somewhere. I actually don't have an example of the text being rendered here, but it's an example of us pulling in an asset and then being able to use it later in some part of the code. Uh, then we're defining uh, a binding called moving circles and we're uh, passing that the output of the scene function, which takes uh, keyword parameters. So, so I guess that's one thing I should mention here is that I will prioritize using keyword parameters for things mainly because uh, I think it makes it easier to read what's going on. Positional parameters are notoriously difficult to understand, like sort of the intent of the code. So having keyword parameters like this gives us the ability to have some kind of structure to what we're passing in. So here we could say the members of the, the, the scene are a list which only contains a circle. So in this case, a list is um, a C function, which is going to take whatever is passed into it and then basically create a list out of that. So it's not like... Um, scheme or lisp where you call list and it sort of creates uh, a um, a linked list of sorts this is going to be a different strategy that we're following because we're trying to be a little bit more um, memory friendly um, circle is another function that takes in details about a circle to be rendered on the screen uh, then we have a timeline down here which uh, you can basically describe events that you want to happen. And you can see here we have at uh, five seconds. So this is a place where we would have some syntax where you could describe a time range. We, we want to say five seconds. Um, so really what you're seeing here is just a hierarchical, hierarchical description of what should be happening in this scene. And then at the very end, we have this uh, call to scene preview moving circles. So we're basically passing in this scene here and then scene preview will be rendering moving circles. And now um, when it comes to interactivity, we should be able to reevaluate this whole form for defining moving circles. And then any change we make to that should be automatically visible in the preview window. So we shouldn't have to restart the whole thing. We should be able to just um, uh, see the changes in real time. Now, what I'm not sure about is if I need to define all of these uh, elements in advance, like the circle, maybe have a, a top level defined for that so that it's easier to uh, iterate on that specific element, or if there's some other ways that I can do this. Um, we're gonna have to play around with that concept a bit to find the right formulation for it. Um, you know, it's just one of the things we'll figure out over time. But for now, I'm pretty happy with this. Um, it took a while to think about how I wanted to represent all this both in the code itself and behind the scenes in the actual language implementation. But I think this is a, a good enough starting point where we could move forward and try to use it and then uh, hash out some ideas. So um, the symbol in the first position of a list is always a function to be called. So things like define or scene or list, they're always functions that are gonna be defined in the C layer. So if you know anything about uh, scheme or Lisp implementations, there's this concept of a special form where it's a function that's defined in the implementation of the language and um, it possibly could have its own rules for how its parameters get how and when its parameters get evaluated uh, normal functions in scheme or lisp have a very specific evaluation order depending on which implementation you're using you, you they basically tell you what the, the evaluation order is but when it comes to things like macros or special forms the evaluation order and how the parameters get used is not doesn't necessarily follow the standard evaluation order of normal function invocation. So um, what we're basically saying here for this language is that uh, all of these uh, call uh, expressions, they expect to have some function that you've defined in C already for now. 
And then those functions can evaluate the parameters however and whenever they want. Um, but you know, the, the reality is that whenever you call one of these, you're, we're basically going to be evaluating recursively everything in this tree to get the values out and use them. So it's not like you're going to have any kind of weird sequencing of evaluation. It's probably, it's going to be what you basically expect, but, um, it is up to the implementation of a given function to, to decide that. And uh, functions will often be called with keyword arguments, but could also have positional args. You'll see here that there is an RGB function that only has positional arguments. And that's mainly just to keep this, the code terse for a very obvious use case. Here, RGB 25500, it's pretty obvious what that means. Uh, for circle, it would not be so obvious if I did not have name, X, Y, and well, color could be obvious, but those other ones would not be as obvious. So um, keyword arguments are gonna be better for, uh, for all that. Bill asked me, have you named it yet? Not yet. Um, I mean, I've sort of been looking around for things that are like, you know, flux control, flux something, whatever. And a lot of stuff is already taken. Apparently flux is a pretty common and popular name for, you know, not, not even just software, other, other things as well. So, um, I haven't come up with a name with it for it yet. Um, but I'm definitely open to ideas if people have ideas for what to call it. Um, since it's very tied to this project, I would probably be something related to Flux Compose. Clux Fumpose. <laughs> that, that's a possibility. All right. So I think that's it. Um, hopefully that looks cool. And we're going to look at more about the implementation in just a moment. All right, let's talk about our tasks for the day. Uh, first of all, what I really would like to do. Uh, I'll show you the code after we talk about the tasks. Um, I'll briefly say what I've done so far. I have the tokenizer working, I have the parser working, and what those both of those do is basically get us into a state where we have an AST for the language that we can then use for evaluation. So the point we're at now is that we need to implement basic evaluation of expressions in the language, which basically means we need to um, write some functions for evaluating different types of expressions to get the values out of them out of them and we also need to work on um, <clears throat> function registration as well so we need to, to be able to register functions in the runtime to be callable so we're going to need that pretty quickly to uh, make this possible um, that might be interesting we'll see how that goes um, I, I haven't really thought about the um, the data representation for that yet and you'll see that I hesitate to just jump right into creating data structures or, you know, arrays or anything like that, mainly because um, I'm trying to be very thoughtful about how I represent all the stuff in memory. So we might, I, I'm going to, I'm going to talk about uh, all that stuff. I, in a uh, gun, I will tell you how I wrote the tokenizer and parser in just a moment. Um, also, I've got a weird issue. Like a couple hours before the stream, I realized that there was a critical bug that would prevent us from being able to do any of what I wanted to do today. So I had to fix that. And there's one little tiny issue left. It is a little bit more than tiny, but um, we're going to try to figure out um, how to fix that. And I'll talk more about that when we actually get to that part of this. And we, what we really want to do is evaluate call expressions. We want to get to the point today where we can evaluate these expressions and do something in the C layer. And if we can do that, then we might be able to get to porting the previous Guile interface code over to the new language. I don't think we'll get all the way there today, but it'd be really awesome if we could. So the, the stuff we were working on the last time where I had Guile scheme code that caused some circles to draw, I would like to be able to get back there as soon as possible. So I think if it doesn't happen today, I might do some work over the weekend to finish up some details so that whenever we... Um, come back on Tuesday, then we can just sort of get started using the language and, and get back to where we were. And then, you know, we, we should try to finish rewriting that, uh, writing that render to file functions where we actually have the ability to send the string over to the C layer uh, successfully. I think we can do that now. Uh, I only just had to write like a whole language to, uh, to solve that problem. So uh, that's where we are. Uh, Bill says, did you write a BNF for it? No, I did not. I, I am taking a fully hacker approach to this. I'm just writing code straight up. <clears throat> okay, so let's take a look at uh, what I've done so far. Um, trying to think of the best place to start on this. What I'll do is show you the internal header. Um, yeah, there's a few things to mention. 
Uh, but we'll we'll start with the data structures. So um, the tokenizer is basically a function in the code that will take a file stream that the user has given, and then um, one by one, look at all the characters in that and decide what type of token that character represents. And maybe if there's a, a substring of characters that represent a token, it will chop that piece out and call it something like, let's say a string or a symbol or a keyword, etc. So we have some uh, definitions for the different types of tokens we might have, like a parenthesis, a string, symbol, keyword, integer, and float. Um, source location is something I'm not using right now, but it is something that will be nice whenever I actually write error messages. So it will tell you which location in the code uh, the problem was found. Um, and then I'm using this uh, strategy for um, modeling the data where you have a struct, which is a header struct for a particular family of types called token header. And the most important piece here, I did not use flex for the tokenizer. I wrote everything by hand. Um, the, uh, the kind of token is what's getting, getting stored there. And then any other struct that represents a token type starts with the token header and then adds any exist or extra fields that are necessary to model that particular, uh, token. And the reason I do this is because we can exploit the way that structs are organized in memory so that we can have a token header be sort of like the generic type for all the different types of tokens, but then we can cast down to uh, the individual token types when we know what kind we're looking at. So uh, it also gives me the ability to store these things sequentially in memory. So basically whenever I, I tokenize um, or parse uh, the code, I'm, I'm writing all these structures out linear, linearly in memory. Uh, it's sort of orthogonal, I guess, to the, the way that I'm setting these up, but it does give me the ability to sort of know what I'm looking at. I can sort of jump ahead based on the size of each type of token and just look at them as a simple, a single stream. Um, so like I said, I'm thinking a lot about memory layout whenever we're d dealing with this code. It's probably not fully necessary because it doesn't need to be the um, most performant parser in the world, but it's an opportunity for me to try to um, in improve my skills with doing this kind of thing because I haven't had to do it. You know, I've been using higher level languages for years and I haven't had to think about where in memory everything goes. So this is a great opportunity for me to actually um, learn some things about that. I'll talk about that more in a minute to, to explain more about what that really means. All right, so for um, that's everything for tokens. Now we also have value types, but that sort of comes later in the pipeline. Um, and now we also have expression uh, kinds. So we can have a list, we can have a symbol, we can have a keyword, and we can have a value. Now other things might get added there later, but for now, um, when you tokenize all the input, you have a, a, a list of tokens effectively. Then the parser takes that list of tokens and turns it into higher level language constructs, basically creates the AST for the language. So now <clears throat> we know how to identify expressions because we know where a starting or an open parentheses started and there's a bunch of stuff in between. And then we had a closing parentheses. And then anything that's in between can get interpreted as something that's relevant to the language. Now, obviously we, we're doing sort of a one-to-one -one <clears throat> mapping for everything aside from parentheses at this point, but it may turn out that uh, with keyword and value pairs, I may have a higher level construct for that that's easier to handle so you don't have to go looking for the value. Uh, so that may be something that changes soon. But um, this is simple language, so we don't really need a whole lot of complexity in that in that part. So same structure here. We have a header type for the, um, the expression family of, of types uh, that has a kind attached. And then we have the individual structs for each kind. So like a symbol has a name. Uh, we have the length of the name. We also have whether it's quoted or not. So we can do symbol quoting, basic quoting basically in, uh, in this language to use a symbol as a, <clears throat> a way to identify something without having it be a, a symbol that tries to be resolved. So we want to avoid resolving those symbols. We just want to use them to identify something. Uh, keywords similarly have a name and a length, but they don't have any information about whether, whether they're quoted because we don't care about quoting keywords. Uh, value types have uh, a value header. And this is a bit of a freaky part of this because we're sort of nesting these concepts of um, having a, an expression header and then having a value header that could be something of various different sizes. Now, you might be looking at this and thinking, well, why don't you just use a union for that? The reason why is because I have value types that have <clears throat> uh, character arrays in them and you can't know how big that uh, object is going to be or how big that uh, struct is going to be at compile time. So there's no way to build a union off of that as far as I know. 
So it's better for me to just sort of deal with this myself. <clears throat> uh, also a list. This is a place where we have lists now. We can have a uh, an array of items that gets dynamically created based on how many things are inside the list and also the length of the, the list itself. Um, also, I've got this concept of cursors here um, where when you want to iterate over how this stuff is laid out in memory, you need a cursor that can sort of say uh, where you currently are and the sort of the list or the array <clears throat> or vector, you could even call it, of expressions or tokens. And then uh, we have a function that can increment that cursor is like an iterator almost where you can sort of get to the next location. So I've basically implemented iterators to some degree uh, here as well. Um, and then we just have some internal APIs that we, we're going to be calling in the unit test, which I can show you in a minute as well. Uh, so basically tokenization, uh, moving to the next token using a cursor, uh, moving to the next expression using a cursor, um, parsing using a, 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 a vector of tokens, I guess you could say. Uh, and also this init function, which probably is being used in tests. Uh, but this is a an internal header file that's only used within the project. This is, these things are not part of the actual public API of the, of the libflux library, mainly because uh, the public API should just be simple where you just call like eval. So I think down here we have uh, flux script eval and flux script eval string in flux.h, which is basically the public API. So anyone who, anyone who wants to eval some script code just calls one of those methods and you're done. Uh, Gun, uh, Gun says uh, not linked lists like where you can insert delete items. The reason why I don't like linked lists is because you're allocating each node of the linked list on the heap and it could just be anywhere in the heap. And if you're iterating of that linked list, you're just jumping all over the heap in memory and you're, you're just getting cache misses left and right. Now, it may be the case that the memory allocator is actually allocating all those probably sequentially in some space, but you can't really depend on that. And the more fragmented the process memory gets, the worse that's going to be. So I don't know, maybe it would be fine to use linked lists. But like I said, I wanted to try this strategy out and uh, and see how it went. OK, um, the other thing that I did for this, which I'll get into the code for how this stuff works in a second. I, I wrote a unit test harness. I know that there exists a uh, unit test harness for C, but because we're writing everything from scratch in this channel, I wrote a unit test harness from scratch as well. So uh, let's see, test main. Um, so the this is super simple code, but it only has to be super simple code. Um, Piotr says you can define your own allocators. That's true. I'm sort of doing that, I guess, but just not at, at the level of allocator. But if you have suggestions on that, I'm certainly willing to hear them. Um, so the test harness is basically just a C program and, um, it will run this test lang suite. <clears throat> and I think that gets defined in test.h. So in test.h, I have a couple macros for, uh, defining a suite and and then also saying whether something has passed or failed a test has passed or failed let's see where is test length suite defined let's find that test lay oh test length suite that's in the the test lang file okay so um basically i just run whatever the suites are and if i add more test suites i just add the function for those here and then it will write out the results at the end and um the language tests, a little bit sloppy here on the, the line endings on the macros, but basically I've written a bunch of assert functions for uh, asserting whether a value is what it's supposed to be and writing out messages. And then I have um, some helper functions for tokenizing and parsing test code. And then I go into just a list of tests basically where uh, I have a test named test lang tokenize empty and uh, I tokenize some code. And I just check what type of token was returned. And if it passes, I, I write pass. If it fails for some reason, which usually is, comes from one of these asserts, then it will show in the terminal that uh, the, t the test has failed and it will tell me which function it failed in. So pretty useful, very basic. I don't really need more than that. And in fact, it's been very nice for uh, iteratively building on what I'm doing here because I can really quickly just run the test and get the output immediately without having to like try to start the program, load a script, etc. cetera. So uh, having a unit testing framework is gonna make things a lot faster here. And I can actually try to run that right now. Um, let's see if I just run, let me just jump back to the main folder, run compile. Um, let's see, make C build and uh, build slash run tests. Let's see if that works. Uh, yes, save it. 
Okay, so it's already finished compiling and running here. I think that I compiled it before. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, uh, test output here. Sorry, um, output logging from the code, but we'll talk about that in a minute too. So um, we run the test runner and man, there's just a lot of noise here from all that, that output. But let me see if I can take turn that off really quickly. Uh, let's go into uh, script.c. I just want to show what the output looks like without all the spew in it. So for these um, macros, we'll just uh, paste this here, clear that out. And um, I'm going to just put in like brackets so that it's like a no op. Let's just see if that works. I'll be curious to find out if that actually turns off all the output. All right, we're compiling, we're running tests again. Okay, cool. So now we can actually see, see the output uh, correctly. Um, and we can see that we have a suite called test length suite and just a bunch of tests that have passed here and one that has failed and it told us why it failed. So it didn't really take long to write a test harness for this. Um, and it was very worthwhile because it, it's served me well so far. Let's see. Uh, Johnny says language design is so cool. Working my way uh, slowly through crafting interpreters book. Uh, oh yeah, that book looks really good. Um, I actually want to take a look at that at some point soon. Uh, Gun says the dragon book is also really worth reading and principles of compiler design. Yeah. Um, I haven't read either of those books, uh, but uh, the dragon book is kind of um, funny to me because in the movie hackers, which is kind of a, uh, recurring theme in my stuff. Um, one of the books that they pull out as like one of the cool hacker books is the dragon book, uh, compiler design. So I don't know. It's, it's funny when people bring that book up. It's super old though. I, I don't know. I've, I haven't read that before. One book that I read, um, recently, what was it called? Lisp in small pieces, which basically tells you how to write a Lisp compiler. Pretty useful for understanding how list compilers work um, and they go pretty deep. And there's another one also I was looking at, can't remember what it's called, Compiling with Continuations maybe. So, you know, there's a lot of really cool compiler books out there if you like learning about compilers. Uh, and lisps are a great language type to write a compiler for. I think compiling with continuations is like a mix between writing a scheme compiler and writing an ML compiler. So uh, it's kind of interesting stuff in that one, but it's very, very, um, it's more difficult material than typical compiler books, I would say. All right. So, um, yeah, test harness. That was really fun to write and very easy to write. Yeah, that, that was probably, I don't know, an hour, hours worth of work potentially. So now we are in script.c. This is the file where I've written all the code. Um, as of right now, it's about 512 lines. And a lot of that is logging because uh, whenever you're dealing with the m sort of memory mechanics I'm doing and also dealing with parsing and, and tokenizing, you kind of need to log stuff to understand what's going on. I mean, you could run it in the debugger too, but I've, sometimes I feel like it's good to have uh, statements that tell you where you're at. Um, so first of all, we can talk about the tokenize function, which um, the first thing it does is it actually allocates a buffer for all the token information. So like I said, I, I don't want to be allocating a bunch of stuff randomly on the heap. I actually just <clears throat> allocate a block of memory about uh, 1k that will store all of the uh, token information um, for the current eval. So whenever you're evaling a, an expression or a script, we are just we have one block of memory that we're using we may have to do deal with resizing at some point if the if the code files get large i don't really know yet uh, we'll have to do some tests on it to see how soon it's needed but uh, we allocate that strip of memory and then we basically go into a loop where we look at every character and uh, decide what type of token it is like i mentioned before there's a lot of redundant code in here because i wanted to write it first and then start breaking things into functions that um take away some of the repetition and also make sure that I don't have little bugs here and there if, if functions are out of sync. But um, very straightforward stuff, mainly because this language is not very hard to parse. That's a good thing about having syntax like this. It's not hard to parse at all. And uh, a lot of it is, is sort of the same pattern over and over, especially when you're doing things like parsing strings or symbols or keywords, because they're just, you know, strings of, of letters. Um, so that function itself is not very long. Uh, and like I said, there's, there's some deduplication that can be done in some of the patterns. And uh, once that's done, you basically end up with a linear strip of token 
data allocated in memory. So I'm not doing reallocations every time. I actually, I've pre-allocated this one block of memory. And then for every token that I get, I'm basically just stamping it out at the next location um, in that buffer that I had allocated that out ahead of time. So everything just gets put in place one after the other. And then when I want to read back through that list, I start back at the beginning, the, the first memory location where I allocated all that. And then I, I step forward using this function called, let's see, it's uh, flux script token next. So you give it a token cursor, which has a location that it's currently at. And then it will look at the kind of token that's at that location. And uh, depending on what type of token it is, it will just increment the pointer location based on the size of that type of token to get to the next location where a token would be. So that gets used both for writing out the tokens and also reading them back because we need to sort of be able to jump to the right location in memory at any given point. Um, so yeah, a lot of pointer arithmetic going on here and a lot of just writing directly to memory. And the danger of doing that is that if you happen to get your calculations off in one of, your, one of the locations where you're either writing or reading the memory, you could end up reading garbage. Um, and then have problems with your algorithm. And this is why I've written a ton of logging that actually writes out memory locations of the things that are currently being worked on. So that it makes it easier to sort of trace through and see where certain things are happening to certain objects. So if I turn on that logging one more time, let's just uh, pull these macros back in. Actually, we'll, uh, we'll leave the parse log out for now. If I rerun the tests, you can see that um, there's a bunch of little uh, hex identifiers at the very beginning. And these are all like the memory locations of the token that we're currently looking at. And I'm writing it out in a way where it's easy for me to pick all these out. So the cool thing about this is that for a given memory location, like let's say this one right here that ends with CA4, if I use consult line and type in CA4, I can see all the locations where that, um, that hash was used, especially if it's used somewhere else in the line and also for whenever the parser is picking up that token and using it. So this made it a lot easier for debugging, having all this log information out, especially with the memory locations. And I can also sort of tell based on, you know, whenever I'm incrementing the pointer, how many bytes forward the pointer is moving to tell whether my calculations are correct or not. So there's a lot of reasons why if you're dealing with direct memory locations, writing all of this stuff out is very helpful. Hey, Minikan. Uh, Piotr says, do you plan to have special literals for time related values might be a cool feature. Hmm. I hadn't thought about that. Um, I mean, I'm definitely going to have, uh, if, if what you mean is like have an actual primitive type where I can parse out like a time value. Yes, I'm going to do that. Uh, in fact, I show that a little bit here where, um, Right there, I have like five seconds. I don't know if you can see, I'm trying to circle it with my mouse here, but that's basically five seconds or 10 seconds. Uh, we could even have something like 150 milliseconds. Uh, I would like to um, be able to parse these things because I think it would be nice to make it very obvious when you're reading the code, what time intervals are being used for certain things. So uh, we will definitely be trying to do some of that. If that's what you meant, if it's not what you meant, then definitely let me know. All right, so that's uh, tokenization uh, for parsing. Uh, parsing is a bit more complicated, mainly because, uh, actually, let's turn on my keycast here. Uh, parsing is a bit more complicated because um, you have longer strips of expressions and when you have lists, especially nested lists, um, to, to write it all out as a linear strip of memory gets a little bit more involved. You can definitely do it. I'm doing it right now, but it was fairly difficult to uh, get through and fix all the issues. Um, I'm, I'm really, really enjoying writing this in C, but the danger of writing this in C is that I have to deal with these kinds of strange bugs where you just get a segmentation fault or some weird behavior and you have to try to trace through it yourself. But I don't know. Um, it's frustrating, but it's also like a really interesting challenge to come up with the tools necessary to make it easier to discover these problems. And also it's very interesting to build that intuition about what the problems could be and just be able to sort of psychically debug the code just by looking at what the output is. So uh, I don't know. 
I've talked about potentially using a different language for the native side of things, but right now I'm having so much fun with C, even though it is problematic at times that uh, I don't think I'm going to do that anytime soon. C is pretty awesome. And also, as you can tell, it compiles super, super fast, and that's great. All right, so um, parsing. So we have this flux script parse function, and we'll get to coding in a moment. I just want to sort of explain what I did because I've been coding for a few days on this off stream. Uh, the parser will also do the same thing where it allocates its own buffer for parsing. We so we have two parallel buffers now, one for tokens, one for expressions. Uh, we'll probably do the same thing for eval as well, but it, it might be different in some ways. Same, same basic idea though. Um, and then we take the token cursor. So we're, we're getting um, a token header passed in, which is basically the start location for the tokens to read. And um, then we're going to plug that into a token cursor. You can see down here a bit lower in the screen. So we have a token cursor. We say the current location for the cursor is the start token. And then um, we start by creating a top level list. So in Lisp languages, you have this con uh, concept of the top level where it's the um, the is effectively an implicit list where you have every expression at the top level of the file and you can kind of treat it in conceptually as if it's a list, but it doesn't look like a list in the file because you don't have to wrap the whole thing in parentheses. So we have the top level list and we are creating that right at that first memory location of the script parse buffer. So we're saying the first thing that you're going to see is the top level list and then everything in what gets evaluated is going to be contained within that top level list create a list cursor then we initialize the list which just um oh let's see i need to turn on uh eglot let's see if eglot will work for me today all right cool um that basically just sets the length of the list to zero the the kind of the uh expression at this point in memory and also the um the first element of the list, we're basically initializing it to the none expression so that we don't end up with any kind of weird behavior because it's uninitialized. And that's sort of another issue with writing code in C and doing some of these things manually with memory is that uh, in other languages, they will pre-initialize things for you in many cases, but in C, you don't get that. So you have to be very careful to make sure that um, if you're gonna be reading values of a particular data structure, you need to make sure that wherever you're creating instances of this, you need to initialize them somehow at a reasonable location so that you can depend on them being what you expect them to be because otherwise you're going to end up with very strange issues so pre-initialization is very important um, a lot of the code that i've written is structured in a way where things sort of naturally get pre-initialized at the right places like for instance whenever you're building the list of tokens or building the list of expressions we automatically set what would be the next token or expression location to a none kind so that we don't accidentally forget in some code path to um, to clean that up and then have the, the 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 iterator just run off into oblivion looking at garbage locations in memory basically um all right so then this function basically just calls directly into a recursive function called flux script parse list which will um descend into the nesting of lists effectively by looking for parentheses so it just uses the um the token cursor and looking at the current token and just goes into a while loop basically looking for the end of the list of tokens and um it will look for uh the print paren tokens to decide whether to go even one level further down in the nesting structure or you know we'll look for certain types of tokens for symbols or keywords etc and we'll set all those things up there's a lot of code here not really worth me walking through line by line to explain it to you but if you want to look at it um it's in the scripting branch of the repo at least right now i'm going to merge this into master as soon as i feel comfortable with it but if you want to look at it it is there um and uh we have some other helper functions here a lot of that's not really worth talking about just yet but um a lot of stuff is related to huh, trying to um, um, judge the size of elements because, like I mentioned before, when you have the, these sort of header structs and your actual struct types can extend the width of that uh, potentially indefinitely based on or uh, to, to an undefined length um, for strings and whatnot, you have to be able to calculate for any given element you're looking at how big it is. So there's, you know, functions here for dealing with that. 
Uh, Gun says, uh, pointer equals OX dead beef. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's a very... Somehow that popped up in my head either today or yesterday also, which is pretty funny. I love this uh, backdrop. So, um, Gun also says, uh, Bison helps a lot when doing parsers. Yeah, you know, there, there are definitely tools for doing this stuff. It would probably have made my life a lot easier, but I really just wanted to enjoy writing this code. Um, the thing that I like about this is it doesn't require any external dependencies it's all part of the c code and it just gets compiled directly in don't have to worry about statically linking stuff or whatever obviously bison and yak they generate something that you compile into your code also but uh this is all my code and it's up to me to uh to extend it and maintain it so i kind of like that you know th that's the whole impetus of this channel is we want to do things from scratch in a lot of cases so i'm not even going to bother using tools like that unless it's really really uh beneficial and in this case i feel like the the value of using uh, those tools isn't worth it enough for me to to try to to use them all right so that's one hour of me talking basically about what i've done in the last uh, four or five days um and i did say in the title that i've you know writing writing is uh what did, I, what did i call it writing a language in five days let me check that creating a scripting language in five days so uh the part that we're at right now is that we can successfully tokenize and parse the input for this language. Um, not everything, I haven't added times yet. I will add times, but you know, keywords, symbols, <clears throat> uh, parentheses, like the general structure of the language is being parsed to where now we can actually look at those and try to uh, evaluate that. Uh, Ayat Cool says live coding in five days. <clears throat> yeah, I, you know, if I had tried the live code doing this thing, it would have taken us like three weeks probably because there's a lot of this that really requires a lot of head scratching and thinking. Um, so yeah, I don't think we would have been able to make as much progress as I did off stream if we had been doing it on the stream. So I feel like it was worthwhile to, yeah, that's a hackathon. It, it definitely was a hackathon. Uh, I had various reasons why I was uh, uh, able to spend time on that the last few days. <clears throat> So uh, I was able to make some progress. It was great. It's, it's always nice every now and then to have one of those extended hacking sessions where you're really deep into some code and you're just building stuff up and like this is like the only thing you're thinking about and you want to wake up early and go to bed late just because you want to work on it more. That's, that's sort of the situation I've been in. So uh, now we're going to take a more measured approach in the streams and try to implement some of this stuff. I probably will continue to do this a little bit though, like do some hacking um, off stream mainly because some of this stuff is not very interesting to watch in terms of live coding, especially if it's the first time I started working in a certain area. Like if I had started writing this language, probably writing the tokenizer might have been fun because that's easy, but the, the parser part is not so easy. <clears throat> Bill says, is circle missing radius? Yes, you're right. It definitely is missing radius. I'll have to add that later. So anyway, the point of that was I probably will do some more work on the language off stream so that next week we will be able to use it for more fun stuff. And I think we're, we're going to be able to make a lot faster progress because of that. Um, okay. So implement basic evaluation of expressions. So um, let's go back to script.c. And um, we're going to jump down to the bottom here. So we can assume we've already got a fully parsed file at this point or expression at this point and we need a function that can deal with um, the actual list of expressions or the top level list of expressions and, and decide what to do with them so i'm going to kind of go top down a little bit at first to sort of get some thoughts together and then we might have to go bottom up to do some of the lower level eval stuff and then meet at the middle a little bit so we'll see how that goes so we have this flex script eval <clears throat> function i think which is part of the public uh, api so we're not going to Excuse me. We're not going to use that one for this. What we're going to do is have a, we'll call it void for now. We'll, we'll fix this in a minute. Flux script um, eval expression. Uh, we'll just say eval expert. And <clears throat> the input to that will be an expert list. Well, no, it might be it might be any kind of expression. So we're going to say expression header. So 
We may also need a cursor because we're going to need to move forward as, uh, as well. And I found that reusing cursors can be useful because it, it, uh, it keeps you from needing to go back and reiterate over everything to get to where you were before. So we'll, we'll think about that for a minute. Um, for now, I'll pass in a cursor. So expression list cursor. You know, actually, let's let's skip that. We'll go back to that. We're going to start simple and try to, to go from there. So expression header. So for evaling an expression, we have to figure out what type of expression it is first. Um, so we're going to use a switch. And we're going to look at expert kind. And for the first case, we're going to look at uh, expert kind. Um, let's see, what should we try to eval first? So evaling values, values are kind of broken at the moment. We may have to look at that too, but evaling values basically requires returning the value, which is going to be easy, which you know, it's kind of nice. <clears throat> so uh, kind value. So I think what we'll end up returning here is a value header because we want to return a value as a result of evaling something um, in theory. So here we can say return uh, expert value expert and then it's going to give me any kind of completion on that uh value so what does it lot like at this point uh returning value header from a function with incompatible result type oh okay yes and this is another thing um since these are uh reused pieces of memory i can't just straight up return that value i'm gonna have to create a new copy of it in memory somewhere. So uh, any of this eval stuff, uh, memory buffer <clears throat> of some sort. So we're gonna need a memory buffer of some sort for this. And um, this is where things get more complicated because you can't just have a linear strip of memory that you're dealing with for uh, storing the things, the results of evaluation, because you need to hold on to some of them. So let's say we've just, we defined a scene and a scene is using um, some other thing, like a circle that was defined and assigned to a variable. So if you have a scene that's currently being used, it's currently stored in memory, and it has a reference to the, uh, the circle that's stored in another variable, then you, well, is it the other way around? Either way, you need to be able to keep a piece of thing, a, a, whatever component in memory that you've already ev evaluated while you're sort of reevaluating re the other part of it. And um, <clears throat> you'll have to do gar garbage collection of some sort. Now, I think that we can definitely simplify garbage collection in the sense that if we're evaling inside of the event loop, then if we're not doing something on another thread, then we have a point in time where we can uh, get rid of the old object and put in the new object without there being any kind of synchronization issue. And we could potentially free that memory or at least um, let go of that location in memory and have it be reclaimed by someone else later. Um, and if we do have basically a block of memory where we're doing these allocations where we don't have to do freeze, free, F-R-E-E, -E, like basically releasing memory, then um, pausing will be less of a problem, I think, because we don't have to worry about, you know, that, you know, any momentary pauses from freeing memory. Now, GC is a lot more complicated of an algorithm. Free is not the only thing that GC is doing or garbage collection is doing. It's doing a lot of like, you know, mark and sweep. It's looking at, it's like walking the stack, trying to find pointers to locations in the heap, all kinds of stuff like that, which is a lot more complicated process. So, you know, freeing memory by itself is not super slow, but uh, the mechanics of checking for what can and cannot be freed is, is more complicated. In this case, with all of the things we're going to do in this language, we sort of know where everything is. There's a lot more constrained scope about um, what variables are current be, currently being used. So I think that we won't have as much of a tr much trouble there. So anyway, all of that is to say that um, I think maybe we just use a memory buffer and just really inefficiently deal with it for now and then later try to do some kind of basic garbage collection that um, 
isn't complicated. All right, so we might do the same thing here <clears throat> where we have like a, a value cursor that is able to just place something at the next location, the next free location in memory. That could be useful for things like lists or um, uh, mainly lists where there's a list of items that needs to be held onto that if you want to read that list and get to its stuff really quickly, then you're pulling a lot all that into the cache at the same time. So that, that does sound like a pretty good idea. So we may have the same structure. I actually started working on a more generalized way to do this kind of what I'm calling vector implementation um, on my other computer. And I did not check it in yet, but I may have to do that soon because I keep doing the same pattern with everything. So I probably should uh, pull that in, but we'll, we'll just write it from hand uh, for now. All right. So um, like I was saying before, we need uh, to copy this, not uh, pull the memory location. All right. So then what we'll do So um, one other interesting aspect of this is we also kind of need a binding table as well. Let's see. We don't need it for things that are being evaled in line. So if you eval a, a function that's calling a uh, circle to define a circle, if it's not being stored as a value somewhere like inside of a scene object or even as a define then we could immediately just drop it in fact that's probably what we'd be doing i mean it's not gonna there's not gonna be a reference to that anywhere so we have a block of memory there's just something that got allocated and there's just a hole there in the memory that won't be filled um hmm trying to think about like we'll have a mixture in this memory block of things that have names and things that don't have names and um there's probably going to be some way we need to deal with that but we'll need a table of binding names at some point but now i'm not going to add that so right now we'll just call this a script value buffer something like that um value buffer initial size i'll set this to something a little bit bigger but it probably we're going to make these expandable at some point in the future where, you know, when you start to get to a point where you're going to exhaust it, it will double the size or maybe use some other heuristic to decide how much uh, of an increase it needs in size. And we can use realloc for that uh, to make it really easy to get a larger chunk of memory that's still contiguous um, or seemingly contiguous based on how the memory works in the operating system. So we'll start with that. Um... Yeah, I'm just going to call that value buffer. And then we'll also add a logger specifically for eval. And the reason why I'm doing this is because it's nice to be able to have log messages that have the prefix like eval at the front. So you can kind of see when messages are being written with respect to a specific part of the process. So um, that will do for eval. And then then I'll, I'll go rip off some code that I wrote here for allocating the buffer. So we're just going to follow basically the same process here. I'm going to change this to uh, value buffer, value buffer, uh, value buffer initial size, value buffer, value log. I know I'm, I, I'm not being very efficient with my keyboard movements, but that's okay. Value buffer value buffer okay so i think we got everything here oh that shouldn't be all caps value there we go all right um uh, gun says create some sort of symbol table where a symbol points at its value storage exactly that's basically what i'm going to end up doing um that will be easier because at least there well no it won't be easier because a hmm hmm Yeah, we'll probably have to have the same kind of structure where because symbols can have, you know, any any size of, of name, any length of name. <clears throat> so to have a symbol table, you're going to need to have sort of variably width um, entries. So I don't know another usage for a potential vector uh, implementation. 
Okay, so um, what we'll do, we need some way to copy something or specifically values. I think values need to be copied. Other things will be recreated. So if we're evaluating a value, and the nice thing here is that eval expression will be used recursively also. So when you're when you're doing evaluation of a tree of expressions, at the lower levels, we're gonna eval something. And if what we get back is a value, then that value can be used directly to assign to something else or to plug in somewhere for um, a, a higher level structure of the code. So I think this is the right thing. We're gonna get the basically the memory location back for what's stored in the uh, the value buffer. All right, so for copying this, we wanna copy the expression value. We actually wanna copy the value itself. And that's easy, we can use memcopy for that. So what we can do is have another function for uh, same pattern yet again, we're gonna have a function just like what we had here for the uh, next token. I'm just gonna sort of steal this pattern really quickly, use it again. This what's nice whenever you write uh, some code is that you can just copy your own code and it's not a big deal. Um, but definitely is begging for some kind of uh, abstraction, I think. So value header, oh, yeah, I'm not gonna go through too much on this value cursor. I'm gonna have to have a cursor type for that as well, I think. So yeah, a lot of stuff that obviously needs to be um, factored out. So flux script value next. Um, yep, value log, value cursor. Yeah, this won't take too long. In fact, what if I do this? Let's do this. I'm gonna use um, query replace. I think that that's good enough, right? So um, token value. Yes, 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 no. I wonder if it can figure out the casing. Let's let's see. Oh, that's amazing. You see that? It actually picked the right casing. That's a, that's really good. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I love that. Okay, that's gonna save me a ton of time then. Okay, some of these things obviously need to go away, but uh, <clears throat> the fact that I can just run through this really quickly is fantastic. And I'll tell you what I did in just a moment. Okay, so um, I ran the query replace function in Emacs, which asks you for what term you want to replace and then uh, what to replace it with. And then it basically just asks you yes or no at any location for the next um, match about whether you want to replace it. And apparently it follows the casing of the matches, which is fantastic because it just saved me a ton of time there. Um, it did miss this one because I told it not to use it, but I think I have a, a value kind none, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So we have a uh, none integer float and string currently. So none integer float string. Uh, there's also entity, which is something that's gonna come later. We don't have that uh, right now. So I think we do have uh, a basically working function for this at this point. I need to go and add the uh, cursor type for that. So let's go down to the end here. We're just gonna drop this in right there. Uh, yes, uh, Gun says it calls for a macro. Yeah, it definitely calls for a macro of some sort. I'm gonna end up writing something for that. I just haven't gotten to it yet. So once I get eval working in this, one of the things I'll do this weekend is clean up the code so that it's much clearer to look at. Um, then hopefully, you know, people can understand what's going on there a little bit better. Okay, so here we're gonna put in value header and, oops, not that, value cursor. All right, cool. Huh, you know, I was calling this expression list cursor, but really it probably should just be called expression cursor. I'll think about that another time. Okay, so back to the script code. Um, so now what we have is the ability to walk ahead, which is gonna be necessary because if we're going to eval an expression, um, for certain types of expressions, we're gonna to need to copy those things, which means we're gonna to have to have a location where we can copy it to. So here, uh, let's see. 
I can say, hmm. The assumption is you'll be able to evaluate something, but really we shouldn't pre-evaluate until we get to the point where we need it. So I can call value next. I don't have a value cursor. Let's see, eval expression. I might need to keep one. So <clears throat> value cursor, uh, value cursor. And here what I'll do is uh, flux script. Give me some completions. No? Ah, here we are. Uh, flux script uh, value next. Can you, oh, come on. So I was using LSP mode on my other computer and now I'm using Eglot and Eglot isn't acting the same way. So uh, it's a little bit inconvenient at the moment. So flux script, script value. There we go, uh, next. And then we're gonna put in this uh, value cursor here. And then we can save that to value header, um, new value. And then we can use mem copy, I think. Can you give me the signature for that? Signature, please. It doesn't like something. Ah, there it is. Okay, destination, which is gonna be new value and source, which is going to be, I think value here is what? Is that a uh, expression value? I think that's just a regular struct member. So let's jump to internal value. Yeah, so that's just value. So we're gonna say, just pull this in. And then we can pass the new value out. Value header, why does it not like that? Uh, expected expression. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know if I did anything wrong in my code. I'll try to compile it really quickly. No references found for, okay. Let's uh, pull the comp compilation buffer back. All right, so we got some comp compilation issues here. Uh, thanks for coming, Piotr. Uh, enjoy your, uh, your feedback on stuff. All right, too few arguments to function mem copy. Okay, fine. Uh, it's not helping me at the moment. <clears throat> what am I missing? Uh, size T. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So at this point, I know that it's. Yeah, okay, I know what the size is. Size of um, value integer. I need to put the of there. All right, so that is basically copying from the old value to the new value location that we just grabbed from the memory block. And we're copying the amount of bytes that are necessary for that integer. Now, we should be able to test this if I, yeah. I'll make it work. So, so we'll, we'll test it and see if we actually get the, the value back that we expect. So it's a great opportunity to write a test. So let's go to test lang. And then we're gonna add a new test here for eval. So test lang uh, eval integer. And um, we'll go up to the top here. We're gonna add a new function for eval. Similarly, similarly to what we have done for the other ones. Maybe I should sort of interleave these a little bit. Arse, eval. Okay, so input uh, expression list cursor. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't really need that. I do need the, the result value though, value header. So let's leave this off for now because I don't really need that. And then uh, input from string, uh, tokenize, uh, parse the code. So the result of parsing the code, let me check what I'm actually returning there. Uh, parse is returning an expression list, which is great. So I should be able to take this um, expression list uh, result. Hold on a second, why am I doing this? Uh, I'm resetting the cursor. Okay. Yeah, I don't need that right now. In fact, I could probably just, no, no, no. I need to do the eval. Okay, so return. We're just going to eval this. So flux 
um, script eval expression result. And it might want me to cast that down. We don't have a list cursor here. I need to get this out of here. So let's see, eval the resulting expression and return it. All right, so flux script eval expression, um, implicit declaration. I think I need to put that in the internal header file. So let me grab the signature for, uh, let's see, eval expression. Let's grab this, put it into the internal header down right here. Make it X turn. Clean it up a little bit. And now in this file, we should be able to use it. Whoops, the test lang file. All right, so if I just kind of clean that up, it should make that marker go away. Okay, what don't you like? It needs to have two things passed to it. What else do you want? Value cursor? Oh, great. Value cursor, yeah, do I need that? Didn't I say Yeah, that's sort of the problem, I guess. You need to kind of have a value cursor that remembers the last place something was put in memory. So you might even need a, a global value cursor that is relevant to the... Uh, the global memory allocation. But that's okay. We won't deal with that right now. Um, let's do this. Value cursor. We're just going to init a value cursor. So value cursor value cursor um, current equals null. Now that's going to be interesting. We need to do a little bit of uh, initialization on that as well. So no, maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and assign it immediately. So the value next we have there. Okay, so here's what I'm going to do for now. No, 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 no. Let's not do that. Here's what I'll do. Since we're evaluating the memory, we know that the, the memory hasn't been set up yet. So we're gonna we're gonna set the value cursor to start with. Uh, current equals script value buffer. Now let me actually just uh, leave a note for myself here. To do this may not be the best place to initialize this, but it's convenient for now. The idea is that we need to make sure that the cursor has a starting point, no matter when we called it the first time. And uh, here that's going to enable us to, let me make sure there's nothing else. Let's see, value cursor, uh, yeah, just current, okay. So yeah, basically I don't need to uh, to initialize this here. I can just say value cursor, uh, run eval with the value cursor. And that should work. Um, result, it probably wants me to cast that down to expression header. Let's just do that to make everything happy. Um, and now I should be able to use eval inside of a function. So I'm gonna start with just evaling an integer. So we're gonna get rid of that part. And we're gonna say, uh, 311. So eval, I think I only take the, the code, right? We'll double check that. Value header uh, result equals eval 311, right? Okay, I think that's right. Eval care input, yes, okay. So now what we can do is uh, check the output. And I'm gonna rip off something I did up here. We're gonna take a look at the, uh, oh, no, let me go right back to where I was. Int value. Let's just grab one of these here. And I'm gonna assert that the, what we get back is a value integer. So value kind integer. Um, uh, let's call this value, value, and we're gonna say value kind here. Um, that's fine. And then, uh, assert int value. We're going to look at the value integer of value. Uh, and then what did I call that? 
Let me go back to internal value integer. Okay, it's just straight up value. Cool. Value, value, value. And that should be enough. So I will say pass here. And we'll see if this actually works. I'll add this also to the uh, suite. Clean that up a little bit. And now we're going to run the compiler compilation buffer. All right, exited uh, abnormally. Hey, hey, Alex. Yeah, it's C time. It's C time, baby. Uh, oh, value integer undeclared, uh, 314. Yeah, this is what happens whenever I'm typing and it doesn't pick things up. All right, so another error. Test length suite, um, expected declaration or statement end, end of input, 337. Oh, how did I end up deleting the final uh, curly brace? Okay, something's wrong here. Exited abnormally. I don't see any errors. Let me take this test out temporarily. Okay, that's very weird. Oh, undefined reference to value log. That is in uh, script.c value log. I didn't make that? Eval log. Okay, so value log should be eval log we're going to use that query replace again value log eval log yes 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 all right that's enough recompile all right so now that's not the the test we had we commented that out so let me go and run this again um segmentation fault interesting so apparently something i did here uh it does not like and it's probably the way that I'm trying to do mem copy. So let's jump back into script.c, mem copy. Uh, we'll just, uh, we'll take that out and see what happens. Okay, still segmentation fault. So one of these things I'm doing is causing a problem. So let's just jump into um, GDB really quickly. Geeks shell. That'll tell us really quickly where it's happening. Uh, M manifest. Uh, GDB, hopefully I have GDB installed. GDB build slash run tests. All right, so we're gonna run that and we, oh, even the assert is a place where it's got, having a problem. So let's see, in test lang, uh, eval integer, so value, Probably value is, does it tell me what? What is it? Uh, display value? Yeah, that doesn't look like a correct. Oh, I think I wrote to the memory location. That's what happened. Okay, let's um, jump back to this. Um, hmm, that's weird. I'm gonna take that ampersand off. That could be the problem. So, this value is not a pointer itself. I think it's gonna do the wrong thing also, but we're gonna figure it out really quick. Let's let's try to run this. We're gonna quit that. We're gonna go back to compilation buffer and uh, run it again. Exit it abnormally. Uh, it does not like the fact that this is not a, a, a memory reference or a pointer now. Let me think a little bit about what this means. So I probably need to do this, I'm guessing, just to make sure it's pulling the pointer or the right thing. So let's, uh, let's run that again. All right, so another seg fault. And um, all right, so let me check what we're doing with our memory locations here. One thing I can do is um, eval log, and I'm gonna write out the location of this value. Let me just delete that. Um, all right, so copying to, and then new value. 
copying integer to. Let's just write that out really quickly, see what's going on there. Did I compile it with dash G? Uh, I don't know. I need to check the, the make files because CMake generated all that. Ah, eval log. Okay, it needs to be, once again, a pointer. So let me just pull that. Expert value. Might need to, to debug that a little bit more. We're going to make progress on this fast, though, I think. All right, so eval log. It didn't even get to that point. Why not? Oh, I wonder if this didn't even get hit. That's very likely, actually. Um, so I'm not even returning anything from this function. So let me just return null to do. Uh, we probably should never get here. All right, so. Let me write out a log statement for um, for this. And I'm going to write it out at the location of the value cursor, the current location of the value cursor, so we know where we're at when dealing with values. And um, let's see, evaling or let's say eval expression kind. And we're gonna write this part out, uh, expert kind. Okay, so we're evaling expression kind one, which is, oh, it's a list. Okay, that makes sense. So, so we, we're at the point now where <clears throat> we need to unwrap that top level list. So, Hmm. Maybe what I need to do is do that unwrapping in the helper function for the test code. So the uh, eval function here, we're going to unwrap it. So we have the result uh, unwrap the first um, expression in the result. So is it logging it to standard error? Uh, no, right now it's, everything's being logged to standard out and I'm just getting the output basically. I can log to any file or uh, uh, file descriptor. Unwrap the first expression in the L in the result. So let me think about this for a second. We have a result here, expert list. Uh, well, we're assuming that we're getting a result back from that. I guess that it's a pretty safe assumption because we are creating that top level list. So. This returns an expert list, so we can we can depend on that uh, result. Uh, items zero. I'm pretty sure I can just roll with that because we just want the first one. Let me jump though to the definition to make sure that I'm not doing the wrong thing. Okay, items zero. What doesn't this not like? Oh, unused. Fine, whatever. So. I can pass that directly in. And I think I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'm gonna have to do an ampersand on that. All right, let's see if that works. Go back to the compilation buffer. Okay, so now we got a little bit different in result, which is good. Uh, Alex says, uh, if the logs don't flush and you hit a seg fault, you might not see them. Yep, that is a problem sometimes. And I think in my uh, log function, I'm flushing. So every time I write a log, uh, log line, I'm flushing it just to make sure. Okay, so um, I need to put in a new line in one of those lines inside of script.c. Let's see, let's see, where was I? Yeah, this, I'm using a mouse. I should really be using Avi for these kind of point and click type of movements. All right, cool. Let's run it again just to get more clarity. Okay, eval expression kind four. And uh, in the list of expressions, I really need a way to translate those back to the name of the kind that would require some kind of function probably. Uh, go to internal uh, expression kind uh, zero one two three four. It's a value kind, which is what we expect. Uh, that's great. 
Uh, next value requested, current kind is 2079, of course. So, do I need that? Yeah. Uh-huh, unhandled, unhandled value type. So, at least for the first one, I need to also initialize it here. Value cursor, uh, current... And then for the current one, I need to set the kind to zero just so that we don't end up in any problems. Now, huh, I don't have to call this right now. Actually, I could probably use the current location. And this is sort of a, um, a, a, a pattern that's slightly inconsistent between um, tokens and, par and the tokenizer and the parser. So. For now, hmm. So let, let's look at the, the way we call next functions elsewhere. Because I want to be somewhat consistent with one of the approaches. So here we're calling next after. Uh, setting the value for the tokenizer. Okay. <clears throat> I probably want to switch that to, to the other approach. But it does require changes to the cursor struct we need not only the current we also need the um the starting point mm. all right i'll i'll fix all that later i want to get this going uh, as fast as possible so let's just let's just do this first um what we'll do is follow a strategy like i was doing before And um, so we're logging, we're copying the memory. We want to copy it to, so new, instead of new value, we're going to say uh, value integer, <clears throat> new value equals uh, value cursor current. And we're going to just cast that basically to the value integer type. So this is what I was saying before with how I'm basically just using a memory location and just putting information there. I'm not trying to allocate anything specifically. I'm just finding a location in memory. I'm just dropping the information and I have a way to go back and iterate over that again uh, when I need to. So what I'm doing here is I'm using the current cursor location, which should be placed at a location where I can put something which the more I think about it, the more I think this is the wrong order to do it, but we'll, we'll get that to that another time. Um, and then I am copying the value from the expression that I'm evaluating into this new location of memory. And then I'm moving that cursor to the next location. So you can see why I'm sort of reticent about this pattern. Uh, prepare the next uh, cursor location. Okay, so now we're returning the value, and I think this should actually work now. Okay, so two failed. At least we got uh, something running. Expected integer negative 15. Did I actually say that? Uh, let's go to test lang. Um, ah, 311 is what it's supposed to be. And I think I'm putting this in the wrong order, aren't I? Oh, value value integer it wants a value integer oh okay I'm, I'm pulling the wrong thing here so in fact it already expects to see a value integer this uh, macro that I defined so it wants a value oh so I'm just passing the, the, the result directly to that okay cool so let's just do this value and 311 and now let's see if that works I think it will work nope wrong all right so what's wrong with this got zero. Zero is kind of interesting because it's wrong but it's very specifically wrong why is it zero um we have successfully validated that it's an integer um, let me write out the thing myself and just make to make sure i'm just going to use a plain old printf uh value is put a new line in and then uh, I'll cast that to value integer pointer. Oops. I 
managed to turn off my audio. That was fun. Let me know if you have any trouble hearing anything in the stream. Double checking. Good. So value, um, value, I think. Let's just write it out, see what we get. Value is two. That's not right. Uh, let's see. I wonder if I'm copying it wrong. Because two, I want to say two is actually 012. That's not even right. Huh. So when we copy it, All right, we're turning it into a value integer. We're treating the memory location as if it's a value integer. And we're copying the current value into it. Um, I have One thing I haven't done yet is look at the actual value that's being stored here. So if I were to do value integer uh, old value, one, once again, my finger did not type that G, equals, we will copy this little bit of code here. I probably need to put an ampersand in front of that. We're going to find out real fast whether this is right or not. Um, and then I will use uh, X. Uh, yeah, 311 is being converted from a, a using A to I for sure. I'm going to put in the uh, old. Oh, wait a second. What is that? Yeah, okay. Old value value and then i'm going to put this as a d so we can actually read the integer value uh copying integer two okay so something is wrong with how i'm grabbing this memory location <clears throat> so let's think about this for a second we're, we're getting uh an expert value Oh, wait a second. Hold on. This is probably due to that thing I was talking about before. Let me just go and check. This is definitely because of what I did before right here. I'm not setting the value for one thing. And the reason why is because it caused some very freaky behavior in one of the other tests. Let's see if we even get that far. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let, let's just focus on the one test for right now. And then we'll turn the rest back on whenever I fix all of this other crap. The value member uh, is the address. It doesn't contain an address. So it um, we're actually, uh, let, me, let me show you. So with this struct, uh, we have this expert header, which is not a pointer. It's actually a um, value, I suppose you could say. And also value header here also is a value. And the reason why is because we want an actual location for this thing to be defined in the memory layout of this struct. So I can get the pointer to this location and then write the value data to it. It's a little bit weird. That's the reason why I uh, left a comment here saying don't trust the size of this field because where I'm actually going to overwrite the field to be a specific value type, uh, which I don't know if that's a good practice in C, but that's something you can do. And it's what I'm doing to, uh, to make this work. So now if I turn off all those other tests, run the code, um, one pass, one failed expected integer 311 got zero, which is very strange. Um, eval says copying integer 311. So that part is right. Hey, Ashraz. Uh, I've basically written a new programming language for <laughs> uh, the project because I was unsure what to do about the, uh, the scheme implementations. Okay, so uh, that's more. He says uh, maybe unions are good for that. Um, the reason why I can't use unions is because uh, the contents of certain uh, subtypes are the, the potential values for them like are st strings where there's there's no predefined length of what the string could be so you can't use a union for that because unions need to know what the actual sizes of all the structs are that could be in the same place because it just allocates the amount of space for the, the largest struct in the set of unions or the in the the union list so you can't really uh use a union for this unfortunately which is why i'm using a more uh complicated approach but it does work okay Back to what I was looking at before. We did see that it has 311 as the integer. 
Next value requested, current kind one. That's right. So it must be to do with how I'm copying that uh, location. So I'm I'm pulling that location of the value as a pointer. I'm referencing the the pointer the value, it's writing out the right value, but then whenever it gets down to the test code, it does not seem to have the right value. Let's set it directly. Let's Maybe mem copy is not doing what I'm expecting it to do. So how about we do this instead? Uh, we're gonna write it out directly. We're gonna say new value uh, kind equals value kind integer. New value, oh wait, hold on. That's not right, it needs to be header. I'm not getting as, as quick of a uh, feedback loop from Eglot. Tagged union with pointer in direction. Uh, well, if you can do pointer in direction, but yeah, pointer in direction requires that you have a, an, a, an address of some other location in memory. And I'm trying to store all this data sequentially in one strip of, of memory. So uh, just allocate it all in one line and I don't want to have to allocate pieces of that and put them somewhere else on the heap, basically. Mainly for performance. Obviously performance is not totally necessary here, but um, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, I'm doing this because I kind of want to learn how to do this effectively. Um, all right, so header <clears throat> and then um, value equals old value value. Let's see if this works. All right, still, it's very strange, to be honest. Something else is wrong, for sure. So I'm returning the value here. I'm trying to think of what else this could be. So if we look at the internal headers, uh, expert value is an expression header. Oh, hold on, wait a second. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Expression header and then value header. Value header is really just a kind, okay? So it's very strange to me why these values aren't coming through. Um, expected integer got zero. Did I do something wrong somewhere else in the test code, I wonder? Value is, oh no, right here in my face. Value is 311. So the test code is not validating it correctly. So am I, let's see, cast, whoa, hold on. Why are we doing that? Okay, okay, that's why. I'm using assert int value. I wonder if that's part of what I was having. No, nah, no, nah, it can't be. Hmm. I need to change what I'm doing here. I need to change that macro to not uh, pull the memory reference of value, which is gonna break my other tasks, but I'll go fix them. All right, so we'll do that, and then hopefully that should fix this. Nope. Cannot convert to a pointer type. Test lang value itself is not a pointer. Uh, that's why. Oh, okay. For all these, for sure. Yeah. I guess the cheapest thing I could do is just dereference this value, but that feels really nasty. All right. I'll do that for now just to make this work. In fact, let's just undo, 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 then jump back and then dereference. <clears throat> okay, now it passes. So um, let me leave a little note for myself here that I shouldn't have to do that. To do, um, I shouldn't have to dereference this. Rethink the macro. All right, so we have our first eval uh, working for just a simple value type, which is great. It means that we at least can eval something that came from uh, normal code. So for those of you who uh, weren't here before, 
So far, I've written a tokenizer and a parser. The tokenizer takes just the input stream from a file <clears throat> and decides what type of syntax element the input is. And then the parser then interprets that into um, expressions. And in this case, it's just a plain value expression for an integer. So it's able to return a uh, an integer value back whenever running eval. So this is sort of the, the foundation for doing higher level types of uh, eval. Um, so we could try to do the same thing for a string as well if we wanted to. Just making sure that the different types work correctly. So we're going to eval a string. Um, And then put a string in there. We're gonna have to use quote, quotation marks because qu strings in this language have quotation marks, just like you know other languages generally. And uh, we're gonna say that this is a string kind. We're not gonna print this out anymore. We don't really need to. Um, I'll leave that out of this. I think I have an assert string. All right, assert string, and I'm pulling it out manually, which is probably the better approach. All right, assert string, and usually, another thing that it's a little bit inconsistent, I'm putting um, the expected value first. So let's say flux harmonic should be expected value. And here, I'm gonna pull out, why is it doing that? I don't wanna see that. Um, value string. Stop. All right, string, right? I think that's right. Let's go look at value string really quickly. Uh, yes, yeah, string. And then I need to go back to script.c and add a case. Ah, hold on a second. So in this um, check, I need to have another function that can uh, basically copy a value out based on the, the kind of value. So probably, oh, actually, I wonder if I should try memcopy again. Let's do that. Will it compile? Yeah, okay, still works, good. So memcopy was not the problem after all. Um, and we can go add this function into the test suite just so that it will run. And we'll see that it should fail. Yeah, even to the extent that it, uh, oh, what happens, man? For some reason, it keeps eating the thing at the bottom. Okay, cool. So not getting what we expect, but that's that's expected because I need to go fix that function. So let's go back into script.c. Um, so value header flux script, ev uh, no, flux, flux script value copy. That's what we're going to do here. And we're going to pass in a value header value um, value cursor as well, because we need to be able to move that cursor forward value cursor. And then um, we're going to switch on the type of value that it is. So what we can do is return flux script value copy. And I think it's what expression is a, yeah. We're gonna copy the expert value, expert value. I probably need a handle for that. Okay. Then I'll take this code. Actually, the whole thing. Let's do this. Let's just take all of that and put it into this function. We also need a switch on the uh, value kind. And uh, let's see, case, whoops, case, value, kind, whoa, wrong, value, kind, value, value, kind, syntax. Uh, you can see that my brain is starting to lose um, clarity as time goes on all right so some of this stuff we can simplify because we don't need to do all the casting anymore new value is 
value cursor current. Okay, that's fine. And then old value, we're just gonna uh, cast. Our old value is value, so just plain old value. So let's just say value. That's the only place where it mattered. Value, value. So we have a new value um, that is bogus code. We're gonna put a value here, I think. All right. And then mem copy, and we need to change this also. We've already pulled that out, so value here. Okay, that looks right. So um, that works for Integers, but what about strings? Case, value, uh, kind, string. Now, this is a little bit more complicated because we need to um, do a little bit more work to calculate the size. Uh, also, maybe what I should do here Yeah, let's, let's do this just to simplify the pattern a little bit. Um, I'm going to say value header new value equals null. Hopefully this is not going to be a problem, but we'll fix it later if it is. Um, return new value. And we're going to leave both these things here. And uh, let's just put a break there. We're not going to return this. We're just going to let new value get set. So new value is um, the location of the current. In fact, that really applies for everything. So we could probably just uh, do this. All right, so let's do that. So the way that we copy the memory is the thing that actually matters. And then at the end, these two things now should not be uh, annoyed. Okay, so copy your eval statement. Uh, copy the mem copy as well. Uh, here we need value string plus um let's see i need to temporarily have a handle on well let's just cast it so value string value length so we need to know the length of the string um where else am i doing this so length so it's all plus ones which because we need to copy the um, null terminator as well all right so value string plus the length of the string so this is necessary because of the way i'm storing this stuff in memory um the specific instance of a value string struct can have a string of an arbitrary length, but we, we know what the length is because we've already parsed it. We have the length information, but when we uh, try to handle this object or this, this struct in memory, we have to be aware of its specific size whenever we're doing things like copying it or uh, iterating over it to get to the next uh, item in the vector. So. Right here, we should have what we need. It's copying string. We're gonna put uh, some little slashes above that. All right, um, value, value. I wonder if that's actually gonna work. Probably is fine. No. Value string probably has string, right? Okay, string which will require me to actually cast this, which is fine. Value string star value. Okay, now I think I'm good. This should work. Let me go back and check my test to make sure I have this here. Uh, eval string is good. All right, let's run it. Something it didn't like. I'm missing a semicolon in uh, script.c at line 570, yes, uh, yeah, I need to finish that. Flux script value copy, I think that's good enough. Another problem, too few arguments. I think I need to have that value cursor as well. And the value cursor is a pointer, so I can just pass it directly, value cursor. Uh, last problem, hopefully, value header, oh yeah, okay. Fair enough, uh, 542. So I need to cast that to um, value integer. 
value integer star, put that inside. And uh, that should be enough. All right, so I think that both tests are passing now, uh, which is great. That means that we have, <clears throat> excuse me, basic value, value evaluation is working. Um, so now we're getting into the good stuff. We have an hour left. Um, the thing that we need to do next is try to evaluate a function. So to evaluate a function, we need to have a function to be able to call. Um, I'm looking at Ashraf's comment. It might be easier to have uh, add more types with the respective uh, copy functions and have have them take the correct pointer types. You might be right about that. Yeah, uh, that's something I can definitely add later. Uh, there's a lot of cleanup I want to do, so I'm I'm very uh, interested in hearing uh, people's ideas on how to clean up the code a little bit because I'm I'm basically making a straight line for getting this working. So obviously I'm not uh, writing the cleanest code just yet. Okay, so what we need is a way to register a function to be called. So we're gonna go into test lang and we're going to um, eval basic call. And what we're gonna do is have a function, let's just call it, uh, do I wanna have, call it add? Might be the best way to do this right now. I mean, we'll we'll, we'll see what happens. Okay, <clears throat> I have to add an, add a function called add, which is not something that I would normally have. But honestly, it doesn't it doesn't hurt to have math functions in this. So I could actually do that. And I would prefer to use plus sign. I don't know if it will parse this, but we're going to find out. Now let's let's go with add first, just just for the sake of our own sanity. Um, so we can't actually evaluate a call yet. What we, we what we have to do. In fact, let me add this test so we can um, see if it fails. All right, so we're gonna do this. Um, let's just run the code. Um, man, it every time it's deleting that last thing. All right, segmentation fault. That seems like what I expect. <clears throat> so now we're gonna go script.c and we need to add a case in eval expression for uh, expression kind list because any list that we see that we try to evaluate, we're going to treat it as if it's a call expression. And the only way that you can create a list in this code is to call the list function. And then the rest of the parameters get turned into a list value in the end. Uh, at least that's, that's what I have in mind currently. All right. So <clears throat> we're not going to do a value copy here directly. We're going to try to actually invoke something. I'm going to return null for now, just because, you know, we, we don't know yet what we're going to do for that. Uh, but to actually call we're going to have to pull off the first thing at the beginning of the list. So um, first of all, grab the symbol at the beginning of the list, and we're going to have to throw an error if there isn't one. Like if you have a list that has an integer at the beginning, we're, we're going to have to um, give an error somehow. I haven't gotten to error handling yet, but we'll get there at some point. So we have a list type. All we really need to do is say um, expert list star expert items zero. And this is going to be an expert header. Uh, let's see. Call. Mm, no. Nah. Maybe. I don't know. Let's see. Call symbol. That needs to be a pointer. And uh, to do check that it's a symbol. I'm not going to do that just yet. What I'll do is just treat it as if it's a symbol just to start with. And um, eh, we can do that. So if call. That's what we'll do. We'll, we'll, we'll just panic for now. That's that's good enough. Call symbol kind equals uh, expert kind symbol. Um else panic panic is great you just say uh i want to bail out and write an error message um <clears throat> so for this one we're going to say um call expression has uh 
expression of type of kind D in first position. And we can say call symbol kind here. Okay, and that's good enough just to bail out if we get something unexpected. And in this case, we can then uh, cast this to expert symbol star call symbol. And what I really want to do is grab the name off of the symbol. <clears throat> so we're getting the name. Um, let's see, care star symbol name equals. All right, so now we have the name and we could look that up in a symbol table. So uh, that requires us to have a couple things. First of all, uh, we need a symbol table. Um, and we also need a way to register a function pointer to a symbol. So that sort of indicates if we want to have a uniform way to evaluate a symbol and get a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a value back, then probably what we need to, need to do is um, have a value type for function pointers. So we can go back to flux internal, uh, flux internal header. Now the thing is, If we do that, we're going to have to have a pretty vague um, signature for that right now. It may be that we change that we have a, a, a consistent signature for all function pointers, but we may have to do some different types of function registrations later, depending on what type of inputs they take. Thanks, Ashraz. Um, So we'll just go with a simple thing for now and then we'll flesh it out later as we always do. Okay, so we're gonna have a type def struct um, value uh, function pointer because it's not really a value function because it's not a function being stored as the value, it's just a pointer. I mean, I guess technically speaking, I mean, we could just call it a value pointer, but uh, let, let's be a little bit more specific for now. Value header, uh, header. And then um, what do we want our binding functions to look like? What kind of signature do we want them to have? So we could go, eh, let's just go right up here. So when you call a function, in the end, you kind of want it to return a value, I think. Value header, um, so flux script, funk add so now if we have this function what parameters does it need to take i think that it probably needs to take uh a list of some sort a list of expressions i mean for now we're just going to have all these functions take that remaining list of expressions and then handle them directly later we can come up with some abstractions so that we don't have to write the bindings manually but for now i think that the best way to do it is to manually write the bindings and have these functions wrap other functions and sort of translate between them effectively <clears throat> so the add function would take some kind of list of expressions it can't take the expert list what it, what it could do is take a cursor to use to iterate over the list. So, um, yeah, that actually sounds like a good idea. So, expert list cursor, <clears throat> list cursor. This needs to be a pointer. Um, now, th the important part here is that whenever you iterate over this cursor, it should only iterate for the number of parameters remaining in a given expression. And that's something I don't think I've implemented yet, but we can get to that in a second. So the goal here would be to iterate over the remaining uh, expressions, evaluate them, and uh, do some work. So in the end, what we would want to do is, uh, yeah, we also need the value cursor too, because we need a way to store the result. And kind of makes me think, I will have to think about a better abstraction for this at some point, but we'll, we'll like I said, we'll, we'll go with this for now. Uh, value cursor. 
value cursor. Okay. So, um, yeah, we need a way. That's the problem. We're going to have to have a way. Uh, the, the, I think the cursor is going to have to have um, extents built into it so that we can configure a cursor to only go so far and then stop. Even though the memory that surrounds it has a lot more stuff it can go to, we just want it to be able to stop. So we, we are basically just, you know, re-implementing uh, iterators here, but that's great. Okay, so while, let's just write out what this code would be. Um, list cursor. Let me go to the actual list cursor implementation. Uh, index. It would be nice. Let's see, unsigned int index. If you set it at a specific location, and say how many indices it has, then the code can handle this. And the index can start at zero. It's all just a matter of the context where you set it up. So um, let, let's go back one step higher for a second and look at how we would invoke that. So um, at this location, we would want to have an expert list cursor, uh, arg cursor. Arg cursor would then, so mm, yeah, I think that's what I want to do. Okay, cool. Arg cursor, I think list, what just happened? Okay, the song changed. Okay, for a second I thought uh, my streaming setup died. All right, so list equals, we're gonna grab, oh wait, I got a little bit of a syntax issue there. You know, I could just set this up uh, directly, in fact, at the very beginning. So here I'm gonna say, you know, let's, let's paste that in. We're gonna take this, move it up here. We're gonna say the list is items. Um, arg cursor index is zero. And then we're gonna iterate it. Flux script, um, what is it? Expert, come on now, expert. I, something here is very slow. I think that Eglot is not coping with CCLS very well. Uh, expert. What is it? Parse list next? Where? Come on. Why is it not updating as I'm typing? All right, I think I'm going to have to pull in LSP mode here because this is going to drive me nuts. Um, That's not the right function. So script parse list. OK, so let's find all the next functions. Next. Value next, token next, expression list next, of course. All right, so go back where we were. Expert list next. All right. And then I think we just drop in um, arg cursor here, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, it looks like it. Oh, come on. Expert list next. Also have a cursor and knit there, which is nice. Cool. Okay, that's definitely what I want. But I also need to take a look at. Um, so how do I indicate that there's no further iteration possible? Returning null is such a dirty thing to do. I really don't want to do that. And I can't do that currently. Uh, short remark, the signature was shown in the mini buffer. Yeah, it was shown for like a split second, I think. But I didn't trust it. Um, 
because things are not working like I expected to with Eglot at the moment. Because I've been we're working with LSP mode on another computer for the last few days, and uh, like I've gotten used to what it does, and this is kind of freaking me out a little bit. All right, so list uh, cursor init. Is that used somewhere? Let me just drop this down here because we'll put it next to the function that uses it. Okay. Let's speed things up a little bit. So we have list and we have list cursor. Um, cool. I could use that. But first I need to go and find a way to set up a maximum extent. And how do I communicate it back? I guess what I have to do is have another function that's able to check it. So maybe that's the way to do it. Um, and then maybe panic or something if someone calls it when they're not supposed to. I guess that's also a good way to know that uh, uh, that someone's doing something wrong in the code. So expression list finished. P, <laughs> can you do question marks? No, you definitely can't do question marks and C function names. Um, I guess you could say has next, has next. Okay, how about that? So someone can call this function. I know that the names are getting a little bit ridiculous, but I'm trying to have sort of like a namespacing approach to the function names. So if I go to expressionless cursor, Unsigned int uh, count. Count is a little bit vague though. Length maybe is a little bit more appropriate. So um, the semantics here would be that in some cases we don't know what the length is yet. Uh, Ashra says, what kinds do you have defined? Is there a nil void unit type or similar? That's a great question. That is a great question. That could be useful. I don't know though if if we would want to actually legitimately return it, but I might need to have some way to um, to have like a nil of some sort. All right. So for now, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go back here. We also need to go to init, and what I'm gonna do in init is list cursor uh, length equals negative one by default we don't know how long the list is now that's sort of the prob hold on we do know how long the list is right because the list itself if it's an expert list expert list it has a length okay so i already have that so the sub list should have its own length. I think I'm updating that correctly. So let's just think about that for a second. I don't need to add anything new to the cursor. The cursor can just use the information from the list itself. So long as we do actually keep a pointer to a list. And if I go into the, hmm. Interesting. Okay. Too many thoughts at the same time. So we're going to do this. If uh, list cursor index is going to be zero based. So if it's equal to the, let's see. So let's say we have five items linked is five. The index is currently four. We can't. Yeah, we're going to just check if it's um, greater than or equal to the list cursor uh, list dot length yeah dot length no minus one um and i probably should return a number for this can i just return like a care i just want a very short number care is probably good enough i know there's there's like a standard bool or something Ashra says something akin to error in Rust or either in Haskell. Yeah, probably I would need to go there, but I have to allocate that somewhere. Well, no. No, no, I don't have to do that because I can return it as a value type and just it will copy from the stack. So maybe I could do that. That's a good idea. 
let's I'll I'll think about that after we've gotten past this stuff. I want to get something done before we um, get out of here today. I think we're going to get function registration potentially done. Or at least working to some degree. Let, let's just see if we can hard code it maybe if we have to. All right. So um, in this case, well, actually, I could just return the result of this, right? I don't know what what value type it expects it to be. So list cursor index. If list cursor index, okay, it has to be less than uh, list length minus one. So I can check this function to see if we can iterate further. So uh, in this list next function, I'm not going to use it, but I will use it here. Where is it? In this func add. So while um, flux script expression list has next in list cursor. Okay, so while there is something left, then we can try to, uh, I guess it's a problem. What do we do with the intermediate values? I guess, all right, so if this is add, let's just assume that we're adding integers, okay? And let's say that uh, for now, the implementation only accepts two. So uh, int um, nums two int i equals zero. Yeah, this is just not, this is very simple implementation. Okay. We're going to, we're going to polish this as we go. So, um, in fact, we could even try to do <laughs> Alex, I think you still have some line width if you want to call a longer named function. Yeah. I, I think you're being sarcastic. We only want to grab two. So in this case, we could use uh, four. Um, I equals zero. Let me just get rid of that. I knew it, dude. Uh, I is less than two. I mean, why am I even looping in that case? Well, it makes it a little bit cleaner. Okay, so I plus plus, and then get rid of that. Um, we're not going to do any checking where I'm just going to try to straight up implement this as fast as possible. So, uh, nums I equals at first we need to get the value out. So we're going to use a uh, flux script expression list next. I really wish I had a better completion going on here. Uh, I think that's still <laughs> gun says, I'm glad he's not using Java yet. Java would be way, way worse. There is a function called that, isn't there? Flux script expression list next. What is your problem? List cursor. Okay, so, whoa. Where was I? Right there. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so list cursor. And uh, we've, we've moved it to the next. Huh. Yeah, I think we should assume that actually. So we're going to move it to the next. And then we're going to grab the value out. So here to do check that the value is actually, oh no, we need to eval that first. In fact, huh? <laughs> yes, exactly. Ashraz. It would be uh, a lot of fun writing all of that nested uh, builder code. Okay, so we need to eval, okay? Uh, expression header uh, result, because these are all expressions that are here. So we're gonna have to eval every one of them. We're gonna have to call flux script eval expression. So this is where sort of the uh, nested evaluation of the entire tree starts to come into play. You know, like the, these functions can cause evaluation of things below them. So flux script eval expression, we're going to use um, the list cursor current. And then um, 
our value cursor. We need the value cursor because we need to know where to store that value in memory, okay? So when we evaluate this, it doesn't give us that. It gives us a value header. So we get a value out of this. And um, did I delete that comment to do verify that it's an integer? Okay. So now let's just assume, which is a great thing to do in C, uh, value integer. And I'm missing the G again. Fantastic. Value, uh, value. All right, cool. So that should give us two values from the inputs. We're not doing any error checking. There's obviously things we need to do to verify that we have the right parameters, but uh, that's good enough for a basic add function. And now, um, well, actually, I don't need to do that. I just need a sum, right? So int sum equals zero, and then uh, sum plus equals. And then honestly, we could just have any number of inputs at that point, we could just take whatever number of uh, integers were passed in. So that's an improvement that could be made to do don't limit the number of uh, inputs. Uh, eval caching to um, hmm. Interesting point. That could be useful. Yeah, haven't thought about that. Uh, Ashra says that there may need to be some kind of eval caching. All right, so now we've got the sum. We can return. Uh, we can't return the sum directly. We need to, to actually get a value that we can use. And this really is a place where it becomes obvious to me that first we need to um, ask for a new value uh, slot, I guess you could call it. Honestly, it's fine to do well, no. I'll have to change the shape of the algo a little bit for that. Okay, we're gonna assume to do, don't assume that we already know the slot. All right, so for value cursor, value integer, value, value. The reason why I don't go make some of these fixes, fixes that I need to make is because I don't want to like drag things down. I'm trying to get function evaluation working before the end of the stream. So uh, we're sort of under the gun a little bit. We've got 30 minutes left. In fact, we got less than 30 minutes because I have a meeting I have to go to literally as soon as the stream ends, which is great. Okay, so um, we're casting value integer, have value headers and output argument. Hmm, I hadn't thought about that. Good point. Um, value integer. Yeah, I guess you're right. You could, well, okay. Uh, we'll think about that. Okay, so value equals sum. Yeah, we also have to initialize this, which really I need, I need some some functions to to make it easy to set these values uh, in new slots for sure. Um, header dot kind equals value integer. I should not have to be doing this all over the place. Uh, value kind integer. So I should be keeping a list of uh, improvements that need to be made. And then. I will return. Yeah, well, I should be doing this value integer result equals uh, no, not value value cursor. So that was already a bug value cursor <clears throat> current. Okay. And then result header dot kind and then result dot value. So let's delete uh, ugh. result value sum. Okay. Uh, all right, then we can uh, return the result. Okay, so now we've written a function that in theory should work. Uh, we haven't written any logs yet, but if we have problems, we will uh, write out some log statements. Okay, so now we have a flux script func add and for invoking a general thing what we're gonna have to do is um, look up symbol make sure it's a function pointer and then uh, invoke it with the 
with a cursor for the uh, expert list. Okay, so that actually makes sense. Uh, let's see. That's a good point. Uh, Ashraz is asking if, if I'm returning something that's bogus, which is actually true. I should probably... Yeah, so... We're going to do this. Uh, value header. The reason why I can't return result specifically is because result is a struct that technically has a value header as the first uh, field in the struct, even though they both start at the same memory location. Um, you have to be a little bit more specific about which uh, face, I guess you could call it, of that struct that you're uh, referring to. Okay, so... Symbol table. We need another block of memory, which is another case where we need all these stupid functions for <laughs> iterating over the block of memory. So I'm definitely going to put together that vector uh, implementation that I had started on and then refactor all this code to use that vector implementation because I, I'm tired of writing the same thing over and over again. So, let's see. Let's cheat. Cheating's great. That's how I made it through college. Just joking. All right, so what we'll do is we're just gonna look specifically for the add function and we're gonna invoke it directly uh, to simulate what it would be like if we did have a uh, symbol table, since we don't have one yet and it's probably not the right time to implement that. I can do that off stream. So here we go. Um, if, where is where do I have the name of the symbol? Right there. So. If uh, string compare, is that right? Symbol name uh, add equals zero, which means it's the same, then we can call flux. This is effectively what we'd be doing with a symbol table anyway. Flux script func add. Where is it? Flux script func add. And the input is the list cursor and the value cursor. Okay. So uh, list cursor, value cursor. I think one of those is gonna need to be, oh, which one? We need the arg cursor for this purpose because what we want is, is for it to be um, restricted to the arguments to this function or at least the, the list that comprises the call expression. Okay, and then the result of that is a value that can be returned directly. So let's return whatever this gives us. All right, symbol name. Uh, symbol name add, okay, let's see what this does. Let's go back to the test script and make sure that we have something there that should work. Okay, let's try to run it, see what happens. Okay, compiler error. Um, 599 in script.c. Okay. Uh, oh, yeah. These are not um, pointers. They are just regular field accessors. And then this one is uh, 605 expression list incompatible types when initializing type expression header call symbol uh why oh uh, okay fine so expression header does that make you happy and then i uh, cannot convert a Shouldn't the R cursor start on index one then? Um, yeah, we'll get to that. You're right. Oh, no, actually, um, this next is actually going to take care of that. So it's going to increment the index. So let's, let's double check that it does that. We, we're actually depending on this index. Haha, <laughs> this code does not increment the index. Let me see. How do I know? They're all breaking. Okay, so let's just say uh, list lust list cursor index plus plus okay 
increment the index because otherwise we're going to have a lot of trouble. Okay, let's go back. Where were we? Um, we were trying to appease the compiler here. Incompatible type for argument one of a funk add. This needs to be an ampersand. And the previous one, expression header, cannot convert to a pointer type. What do you want me to give you an, uh, oh, okay, 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 fine. Let's do that. Come on now. Value is undeclared in 572. Um, yeah, you're right. So result, result is what I'm looking for. All right, segmentation fault, our favorite. So let's think about why this is happening. So we're, we're doing some tokenization stuff here. Interesting that it keeps going. GDB, uh, yeah, you're right. Let's let's actually do that. Instead of trying to, to do psychic debugging, I should just run GDB when this happens. Run. Okay, so, oh, okay, interesting. So basically, flux script token next, why? Can we get a backtrace? Okay, cool. Parse, oh, okay. Interesting, we got some issue. Oh, is this the same problem we were having before? I had a freaky issue earlier with integer value types somehow overwriting stuff in another location in memory. I don't know what I did, and I still haven't figured it out yet. Uh, let's see. Eval, script parse, parse list, parsed list, that's the nested list. Token next, line 89 in script.c. So at this point, segmentation fault while pulling probably this current kind, I would think. But how is the cursor busted at this point? It must be that same problem, it's overriding memory. So let's go look at my, um, yeah, I'll tell you how I'm, I'm debugging these things. Let's go back to the compiler output here. So uh, all of a sudden, we've got, so so these these hex values at the very, very beginning of the lines are memory addresses of the things being worked on. You can see when we get to right here, we, we're, we've asked for an, a next token, and then we've got this next value, which is completely out of left field. This is where we're getting a segmentation fault because it's reaching for something that's completely out of the scope of the memory block we have. So um, somehow the token list is being corrupted. And I'm not, I, that's, that's where I was, where I left off earlier this afternoon whenever I was looking into this. Somehow setting a value for a value integer magically corrupts the original token. I don't know what I did. There's some, pointer stuff I'm doing that probably cause it. So I think we're seeing a manifest manifestation of that right now. Um, okay, so Ashra says, F sanitize address gives great additional information. Is that a GDB parameter? All right. All right, so we got, let's say about 10 minutes. Um, we could try to fix that problem. The alternative, well, okay, cheating doesn't really help. If, if we just have a function that takes no parameters and we just call it, it doesn't really help. I mean, that, that would show that we could call something, but we don't have a symbol table yet, so we're not validating anything other than just the fact that uh, string compare works. So um, it's better to try to fix this bug, I think. In fact, let's go look, uh, let's see, enable special form registration. Haven't done that yet. Haven't done that yet. Basic evaluation of expressions. Okay, we did that, I think. We, we sort of did that. <coughs> uh, okay, there's a, a compiler edition that needs to be turned on. Okay, great. 
Um, all right, so um, let's really quickly try to figure out why this is happening. So the value integer code right here, somehow this is setting the token kind. Something I'm doing here is bad. Okay, inspect the current state within the backtrace. Not sure that will bring something. Yeah, it's it's right here where something is going wrong. I mean, maybe I could set a breakpoint there with GDB and uh, try to inspect things to see how it could be happening. Um, the interesting parts are that we have a couple of symbols here. Sorry, we have a symbol and two integers that are being parsed. We have add one, two. We can see that the tokenizer is picking them up and it's uh, putting the information about those tokens in memory at these locations that you're seeing here. Somehow, I think it's always the last integer that gets uh, overwritten. So next token is three. Let me go check test lang. Let me turn off every other test and see if this is not some other weird issue. Yeah, same problem. So. We finished tokenization. Um, I think the parsing is happening here. And we don't even get... Oh, okay, that was part of the problem too. We never even get to the final um, parenthesis that closes out the expression because we've already destroyed the final uh, tokens in the list. So we never even find the last uh, closing paren. Which is a very strange thing. Somewhere in all this code, I'm doing something really bad. And so, oh, watch this. Somehow it manifests by doing that. Like if I if I take this line of code out, all of a sudden, well, okay, it's still seg faults. So maybe this is a different issue. Uh, maybe it's not the same thing because the output still seems the same. Um, let me turn back on the parser logs really quickly and see maybe if anything else jumps out. Let me uh, uncomment that and then comment that out. A lot more output now. All right, so the lines with parser from the parser. Uh, let's see, parser got token five. That's an integer <clears throat> setting integer one. Okay, so we've, we're putting that into an expression. Setting integer two. Okay, so the parser found the one and the two. It's putting them into that expression list. And then somehow next token is three, which makes no sense because it's supposed to be one, which is the closing parenthesis. So somehow uh, something got overwritten. Let me think about how this could go. Somewhere I'm using a pointer to set a locate, uh, set something in memory. Actually, what's, what seems to be happening very specifically is that the kind of a token is changing. So maybe if I can see where kind equals is, is coming up, that's all in the tokenizer. That all makes sense. Here, how, how about, excuse me, how about we do this dot kind or no uh, slash dot kind? All right, cool. Consult line is easier. Uh, Alex got his popcorn out. All right, so paren header dot kind. That's a closed paren. That's still token code. That's a list kind symbol. Symbol in this case is an expression symbol. And we're not setting it to. Yeah, I don't think it's null termination. Shouldn't be null termination. I don't know though. Uh, keyword header dot kind. Okay, so keyword here is an expression keyword. It's coming from the expression list. Um, all right. Integer header kind. Everything there looks good. And that is setting the value. I 
That should be fine. And we're not dealing with any strings here, so none of that should actually have an effect on it. Uh, that's another thing. String token. Okay, we're already back to the beginning again. You can watch the state of the token, but I'm not sure how to set up within GDB's terminal. Yeah, there's a, there's a way to set watch variables for sure, but... Oh, and you can watch memory locations too, can't you? Huh. Oh, you know, that would be cool. If I can set a watch on the specific memory location and see when it gets set, maybe I can figure out when this happens. Uh, okay, five minutes. Can I figure out how to do this? Let's see. Um, let's pull up a Firefox window. How about this? Uh, GDB uh, breakpoint memory address. Can I set a breakpoint on a memory access in GDB? Come on. All right, set a breakpoint at address address. You can use this to set breakpoints in parts of your program which do not have debugging information or source files. Okay, so um, what I would need to do is set a breakpoint before a, a, a piece of the code. And I guess what, what is the format that it needs that information in? I can set that. Um, damn, we're going to run out of time. I'm going to use a GDB integration in Emacs to make this a little bit easier. Let's actually try. That's a code address, not a memory address. Is that right? Watch points. Ah, watch. You're right. Examining memory. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Watch. Okay, uh, GDB watch points. Uh, this is sourceware documentation. What is that? Give me the actual GDB. Um, so address. An address cast to an appropriate data type. Watch a four byte region at the specified address. That's cool. All right. All right. That's going to be super powerful for figuring this stuff out. If you all right, watch memory address or expression. Okay. Cool. I should be able to just type it in zero X and then whatever I'm writing out in my own code because that, that is writing out the memory location. So let's just give it a shot really quickly. Um, GDB. The good GDB, whatever. Uh, we're going to run this the same way as we do everything else. Uh, in fact, let me pop back to, whoops, yeah, that folder. We're going to run uh, geeks shell pure dash m manifest scm dash dash gdb full name uh, slash build slash run dash tests. All right. And then we're going to use run here. Okay, so now we've got all the same output. I want to go into script.c and at the end of tokenization, tokenization, uh, let's see, to tokenization start. Where is the end? Way, way, way down here. All right, right here. So, <clears throat> um, Yeah, let's see. A uh, good breakpoint. Set a breakpoint at the current line. Uh, let's see. I think it did it. So now if I go into the uh, GDB or good shell, I can type run again. Start from the beginning. Yes. I uh, hit the breakpoint. So now if I look at, let me drop this down a little bit. So the integer... Maybe it's the close paren that we're having problems with. And the close paren is this memory location. So if I copy that, uh, was it watch OX? Cannot watch constant value. Why not? Is it because it needs a width? All right, let me uh, try copying that at the beginning. Because I think it is an unsigned integer that I'm... Uh, 
I'm dealing with there. Oops. Hardware watch point. Let's see what that does. All right, so um, how do I do continue? Just continue? Or is it run? Where is this happening? I think I must have hit the point. Flux script parse list. Um, token cursor, list cursor. Old value, new value. Oh, that's it. That's what's happening, I think, right? Hold on a second. At C20. Um, hold on a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Put the wrong thing. No, no, no. Is that right? 407C20. 407C20. Why does I have that? I don't know why I have that same uh, line in there. All right, so C20, next token is zero. Close paren. And close paren is supposed to be... That should be one. Ah. Uh, um, is that right? I guess it is right. Oh. I'm not sure. Parse list starting at 407C20, which doesn't make any damn sense. Well, anyway, this is definitely the way to figure this out. Just setting up a, a watch point in the memory location. I need to be more specific about the location and make sure I'm doing it correctly. But once I have that set up, I should be able to figure out what part of the code is squashing that um, or stomping on that piece of memory and changing the value in a way that uh, causes problems. So that was that was cool. Thanks for, for the suggestion. Um, uh, let's see. Was it Ashraz who said that? But uh, anyway, I think we made some progress today. Um, I definitely see a number of places where I need to go and clean up the code a bit and make it a little bit uh, easier to maintain and easier to trace things that are going on. I mean, I've got a ton of logging and stuff in here already, but some of these patterns are repeating a lot of places and I don't have functions that um, abstract some of that out. So I really need to take care of that. But as it stands, as a result of five days of coding on this, I think that we were at a very good position to have something working on Tuesday where I've got a lot of these issues figured out. I may have already implemented stuff like symbol tables um, and we can actually start using the language. Now, the question is, should I go ahead and implement that stuff or is it gonna be interesting enough to watch me build the symbol table stuff on stream? Should I just clean up the code and then wait until Tuesday maybe and finish up this stuff? It might be more fun to do it on the stream because I think it was kind of fun today. We only had two hours because I was talking for one hour at the beginning about the uh, uh, design of the language, so. I'll think about it. I might actually wait and do some of the stuff the next stream because we might get to the point where it all works and then we can start you know, converting the old code over. And then by Thursday, we'll be using our own language to power uh, everything that's going on. Uh, th I think that'll be fun. Let's do that. Okay, so uh, let me just write down the stuff in the notes for next time. So next steps, um, let's see, clean up some of the repeated patterns in uh, the code. Uh, use GDB uh, watch to figure out why uh, token kinds are being overwritten. Um, and then we will get back to the rest of this stuff the next time. So yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty happy with the results of things. I'm, I'm actually very happy I decided to do this because I think it's going to be more interesting having our own language and building up the tooling around it than it would be to just use something else because uh, we have full control, like I said before. So uh, that's going to be a lot of fun to me. So uh, thank you, everybody who was here today uh, watching this for three hours and giving really good uh, suggestions and feedback. I really appreciate all of you who are actually engaged and uh, and helping out. This it means a lot to me. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we'll see you on Tuesday. I'm going to uh, commit the show notes and the code that we worked on. Uh, probably not immediately because I have stuff going on, but uh, 
very soon I'll, I'll be uh, posting that up so you can take a look at it if you want to um, just keep in mind that it's in a different branch it's in the scripting branch on the flux compose repo so uh, thank you all for being here uh, and we'll see you uh, well some of you I'll see you probably tomorrow because there'll be a system cracker stream but then the rest of you I'll see you on uh, on Tuesday so anyway thanks a lot and uh, keep it creative see you next time now I have to find my thanks for watching screen. Bye-bye.